Good evening, everybody, to the weekly Thursday University of Miami uh, symposium on cerebrovascular and skull base topics. Um, it is session 13 on August 13. Hopefully, it's not a bad omen, uh, but uh, I am sure it's not. Uh, I'm Jacques Morcos, professor and co chair of the Department of Neurosurgery and director of vascular and skull base surgery. Co directors of this course has been and are Carolina Benjamin, assistant professor specializing in brain tumor and skull base surgery, director of our cadaveric canes lab, Michael Ivand assistant professor, director of research, UM Brain Tumor Initiative, specializing in brain tumor, skull base, and epilepsy surgery, as well as my two endovascular, open vascular uh, partners, Bobby Stark, uh, assistant professor, co-director of endovascular neurosurgery and director of endovascular research, as well as Eric Peterson, associate professor, director of endovascular University of Miami. This is uh, beautiful Miami. Uh, this, these are our two main centers, UMH, University of Miami Hospital, Jackson Memorial Hospital. These uh, uh, symposia have been quite popular in COVID era. Uh, this is uh, the link, as you probably know, how to reach uh, to register. This is a list of sessions we've had over the last uh, several weeks now. And we are now down to here. Uh, and more sessions are in the works. Housekeeping instructions. Please, audience members, use the Q&A box to send your questions. Uh, we will address them at the end of the presentations. We are not, we are not offering CMEs. Uh, if you like these sessions, please share this information on your social media. I don't think it'll be a problem today, but uh, our speakers will speak for 25 minutes each. If I think they need a reminder that we're nearing the 25 minutes, I will let them know. Very importantly, and I do really mean this, uh, I am open to suggestions as to what topics in cerebrovascular and skull base you, the audience, would like to hear us present and or who, what speakers you'd like us to invite and please feel free to email me. You can see my email there. Uh, or I'm on Twitter also, or perhaps tonight in the Q&A box, you can let us know. Next week, we have a fantastic panel on dural AV fistula. Uh, Luca Regli, rethinking the concepts and adapting the classification. Greg Zipfel, Rethinking the Natural History and Adapting the Management with wonderful panelists, Rose Du, Alfredo Petrosa, Henry Wu, Pascal Jabour. In addition to the Thursday symposia, Mike Ivan, my partner, has been doing a very successful Wednesday symposia series as well. And next, and, uh, it's a Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. Next week is Charlie Tio, who will talk about keyhole surgery for gliomas. Again, every week I say it with great pleasure, many, many thanks for the team behind the scenes who, are, who is making this possible, Ingrid, Roberto, Cristina, and Ignacio, who is running this webinar tonight, as he does every week. You can connect with us, as I said, through the link at the top, Twitter, emails, Instagram, and so forth. If you want to know more activities we're doing, and particularly if you want to watch these recorded sessions, we have a bunch of them now already on our uh, uh, YouTube channel. Um, and the world is going through very challenging times. 2020, as you know, has not been a very good year and is still not a very good year for the US, for Lebanon, for the world, and so forth. Um, it's, it's probably why we're here uh, virtually. Um, I, if I could say something really a little bit off topic, I'd like to encourage all of us. We all have very good stories to tell, very good positive stories to tell. Um, I encourage you all to, to say them, to try to drown all the negativity that is surrounding us in our social turmoil. I, I put my, my two cents together in a publication 
last week in JNS talking about the struggle that we are having here in the United States. And each one of us has a similar story to tell. And I love this quote by George W. Bush, immigration is not just a link to America's past, it's also a bridge to America's future, which will uh, help me go to the next slide. And when I looked at this, I say, you know, these are some of the top people in the field and, 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 and look at it there, of course, we uh, and they are all Americans, but of course, everybody has roots from different places. So it'll be, it's a great pleasure to introduce them to you today. Bernard Bendok, uh, Roots in Lebanon, Professor and Chair of Neurosurgery, Mayo Clinic, Phoenix, Arizona, has been doing a fantastic job heading that program over there. Adnan Sadiqi, Professor of Neurosurgery and Radiology, University of Buffalo, Buffalo, New York, since 2007. He's been there, originally from Pakistan. Ali, Muhammad Ali Aziz Sultan, who used to be my resident many moons ago and uh, is now Associate professor, professor of Neurosurgery at the Brigham at Harvard in Boston, left us to my chagrin many years ago originally from Afghanistan. And if I have an interesting story to tell as I published, Ali has a 10 times more interesting story to tell and I'm encouraging him to put it in writing and it will have an outlet somewhere. And last but not least, Gavin Britz, professor and chair of neurosurgery at Methodist in Houston, originally from South Africa. And again, uh, it's wonderful to have those four duly trained uh, endovascular, open vascular uh, uh, experts with us today. Now on to the two uh, speakers of, of, the, of the evening. First, Robert Harbaugh, Senior Vice President, Penn State Health, Distinguished Professor and Chair of Neurosurgery, Professor, Department of Engineering Science and Mechanics of, at Penn State. Uh, the, uh, Bob did his undergrad not in Lebanon, uh, even though I would have wished for him to have done it in Lebanon, which is where I'm from originally, but Lebanon Valley College, MD Penn State University Medical School, residency Dartmouth. Uh, he's chair at Penn State since 2003, and I think he is the only chair that kind of came back to his, uh, to his old school. Uh, he is professor of engineering science and mechanics. A lot of his other work besides what he's going to talk about tonight relates to a complex understanding of, for example, aneurysm geometry, hemodynamics, and you can see where he gets his expertise from. He has had the highest award that his uh, school can give him, which is Distinguished Professor and Alumni Fellow. He is senior VP there since 2018, extensive publications, books, papers, abstracts, symposia, amazingly has had continuous funding from various sources, including NIH, since 1985. And probably the easiest th thing to do with Bob is to tell you which societies he has not been president of. But uh, in any case, he's been in organized neurosurgery, past AANS president, senior society, ABNS, Neuropoint Alliance, uh, absolutely uh, a, a powerful moving force in organized neurosurgery. And we all actually owe him an immense debt of gratitude for the time, the effort, and actually the intelligence with which he has shaped the field of neurosurgery and continues to do it. Um, next is John Wilson, David L. and Sally Kelly, Professor and Vice Chair of Neurosurgery co-director of Neuroscience Service Line, Wake Forest University School of Medicine. John, uh, who is, by the way, an accomplished fisherman, and I'm always jealous of uh, all the trips he's been taking for the last 30 years with good friends of mine as well, and he goes to all the fantastic places. He grew up in Sharon, small city Sharon, Pennsylvania. He did a combined program in five years, undergrad Penn State, MD at Jefferson, so if there are any deficiencies in his knowledge, John, we will blame it on your very brief five year, much shorter than the rest of us experience. He was a general surgical residency for about three years at Allegheny General Hospital, did neurosurgical residency at NYU, then finished at Tufts, where he's been immensely influenced by the gentleman whose picture you see, 
Bill Shukart, who was a phenomenal surgeon, incredible attention to technical detail and, and uh, uh, good attention to tissue handling. John did a fellowship originally in complex cervical spine, which explains why he keeps his interest and has an active spine practice in addition to his fantastic cerebrovascular practice. He started practicing at Allegheny General Hospital and then Wake Forest recruited him in 93 and has been a cerebrovascular and a spine surgeon ever since. John has equally served uh, organized neurosurgery in a fantastic way. He's of course our current WNS president, has been president of the Southern, of the Sun, has shared the CV section, and has done a fantastic job in, in the very difficult job of running the Washington Committee, WNS, CNS, Washington Committee. But of course, these two gentlemen are fantastic experts in uh, cerebrovascular and particularly they have had an interest in carotid uh, surgery, carotid trials and so forth, which is why they are here today. So I will stop speaking and I'm going to invite Bob to start to unmute his phone, share his slides and start his presentation. Can you see my presentation? We see you, no. Yes, now we see it, Bob, if you can play okay. it in the normal <clears throat> mode. Is that, that okay? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so uh, first, thank you very much uh, for the, the opportunity to participate in this shock and for that very, very kind introduction. So uh, much appreciated. And I think this is a, a great um, series that, that, that you've developed and, um, you know, this, this is, I, I'm afraid, maybe the, the new normal, but, but congratulations on doing this. What I wanted to talk to you about tonight is uh, management of carotid stenosis and, and, and look at it from various uh, angles. You know, the carotid disease has been studied with randomized trials, I think more than anything else in, in neurosurgery. So we do have RCT data to review. There are also a, a, a lot of registry studies uh, out there on the management of carotid disease, and I think registries are an important way of adding to our knowledge. And then finally, my, my personal uh, experience. Um, you know, there is going to be a comparison of open versus endovascular treatment of carotid disease, but I think the, the key is, um, you know, really um, complete institutions have both options. Sometimes one's better, sometimes another's better, and, and it's important to keep that in mind. I, I don't see uh, angioplasty and stenting and endarterectomy as, as competing, but rather as complementary um, uh, approaches to the management of carotid artery stenosis. Um, disclosures shows I'm adequately bought and paid for. Uh, there's no conflict of interest in regard to the uh, topic to be presented uh, tonight. Um, so the overview, we are going to look at uh, evaluating endarterectomy versus angioplasty and stenting uh, through both randomized trials and registry studies. Um, I think another really important issue, probably more important than endarterectomy versus angioplasty and stenting is invasive treatment versus medical management uh, alone. Do, do we need to do invasive treatment at all? And we're going to talk a bit about CREST-2 and then uh, finally sort of finish up with, you know, my personal uh, experience in managing a, a lot of patients with uh, carotid artery stenosis. So let's start with CREST. I mean, this audience understands uh, CREST. Um, you know, it was a randomized controlled trial comparing endarterectomy versus angioplasty and stenting, and it was for both symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, patients. Um, the uh, uh, procedural composite end uh, endpoint was stroke, MI, and death. Uh, they also looked at long-term endpoints of ipsilateral stroke up to four uh, years. Um, and as this was uh, reported, what you can see is that if you look at the you know, procedural composite, there's really no statistically significant difference between 
angioplasty and stenting and endarterectomy. That composite endpoint of stroke, MI and death, 5.2% in angioplasty and stenting, 4.5% in endarterectomy. Uh, P-value there is 0.38. Similarly, at four years, 7.2% uh, uh, um, uh, ipsilateral stroke in angioplasty and stenting, 6.8% endarterectomy. No um, uh, significant uh, uh, difference if you look at that composite uh, endpoint. Um, there was an interaction effect that suggested that older patients may do better with open surgery and, and younger patients do better with uh, endovascular treatment. But the, the report was that these are equivalent procedures. I would quibble with that. Uh, I think if you really look at the various uh, endpoints that were evaluated, not the composite, what you see is that in the angioplasty and stenting group, the MI rate was considerably uh, less. Um, and, and that was, uh, you know, if you look at the areas where one of these two procedures was superior to the other, angioplasty and stenting was superior to endarterectomy if you looked at myocardial infarction in all patients. Uh, also, of course, cranial nerve injury. You don't have the cranial nerve injuries um, with the endovascular treatment. Uh, endarterectomy, however, was st statistically significantly superior to angioplasty and stenting in procedural stroke in all patients, uh, stroke in symptomatic patients, stroke and death in all patients, stroke and death in symptomatic patients, uh, four-year uh, stroke rate in all patients, uh, four-year stroke and death rate in all patients, uh, uh, same in symptomatic patients, and perhaps most importantly, uh, significantly better in uh, overall quality of, of life. Uh, there was no significant difference between the two in the composite endpoint, which was what, what was reported. Uh, and there was also no significant difference in myocardial infarction if you looked at only symptomatic patients. So, you know, honestly, I would look at this data and say, this is pretty much an endorsement for endarterectomy. Um, but if you look at that composite endpoint, you, you couldn't see the significant differences that existed in the various treatment options. There was a follow-up, 10-year follow-up, and again, if you look at the composite endpoint, what you see is there's no significant difference out to, to 10 years. 10-year uh, stroke and death, it, 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 these curves are remarkably similar, so I think both uh, end of end of endarterectomy and angioplasty and stenting, you know, achieve what you, you want to do. Um, there's just a higher perioperative risk with angioplasty and stenting, and then the two procedures seem to be parallel uh, from there on. Uh, same thing if you just look at, at stroke. So what I think this tells you is that you know, it's that early perioperative period that differentiates endarterectomy and angioplasty and stenting, and from there on, the curves parallel each other. There are a number of other randomized trials that I'll go over very quickly. The International Carotid Stenting Study was a multicenter randomized trial. Again, the endpoint of stroke, death, and MI, uh, 1,713 patients. Um, in this study, 8.5% uh, angioplasty and stenting. Uh, composite endpoint versus 5.2% endarterectomy, and that was st statistically significant in favor of endarterectomy. Uh, interestingly, they did not find the difference in uh, MIs. There are three fatal MIs uh, with CAS, four non-fatal MIs uh, with endarterectomy, um, not different. Um, uh, one really interesting piece of this, I thought, was a, a sub-study of ICSS um, where they, they looked at MRI following either angioplasty and stenting or endarterectomy, um, found that after angioplasty and stenting, there was a, a 50% uh, incidence of new ischemic lesions on the MRI. There was 17% after endarterectomy, and the angioplasty and stenting patients were more likely to have persisting lesions at, at one month. Um, moving on to some registry data, I thought this was an important uh, study that came out in the Ju European Journal of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery in 2015. And what they did is they, they looked at a large number of reported uh, registries 
in both asymptomatic and symptomatic patients. And the, the size of these uh, little uh, balls here um, uh, shows the, the number of patients in, in the study. Red are angioplasty and stenting patients, blue are endarterectomy patients. And I think if, if you look at this, there, there does seem to be a separation that if you look at death and stroke rates, um, they, they are higher for both uh, asymptomatic and symptomatic patients with angioplasty and stenting than with endarterectomy. These lines um, are um, the, uh, the line, the, the point at which you may have value from your procedure. So in uh, asymptomatic patients, um, you know, going all the way back to the ACAS study, the thought was if you could do your procedure with less than 3% complications, that you would have a, a benefit. Um, I think that that's probably too high. And I would suggest that if you want to have a benefit for asymptomatic patients now, because the medical management has improved so much, you probably need to be able to do your procedure with a less than 1% complication rate. So those are the two lines. For symptomatic patients, 6% uh, was the, the NASIT suggestion. Uh, I think you probably need to do it with 3% today. And I would suggest that for asymptomatic patients, I'm not sure any of these registries would actually show a benefit over medical management alone. For the symptomatic patients, I think there are quite a few of the carotid registries where that would be the case, but, but not with the angioplasty and stenting uh, registry data. Um, this is, a, a, I think, an important study that didn't get as much attention as I suspected it would. It came out in uh, JAMA 2017. Tom Brott is the senior uh, author. And basically what, what it shows is if you look at uh, a large number of endarterectomy and angioplasty and stenting uh, patients in the U.S. Medicare uh, database, uh, what you see is, is very interesting. They looked at this over a, a long period of time. And so if you look at the um, ischemic stroke or death, ischemic stroke, MI or death, all-cause death, and look at 1999 to, to 2000, uh, you, you see that for endarterectomy, those numbers have improved and they've steadily improved over time. I mean, one of the criticisms of endarterectomy is it's old technology. It's something you've been doing forever, and the new way to do this is endovascularly. So that technology is you know, constantly improving, and we're going to do better and better, but endarterectomy can't. And actually what the data shows is exactly the opposite, that the endarterectomy um, uh, complication rates have steadily gone down, I suspect because of perioperative uh, management choices. Whereas angioplasty and stenting in a very large number of patients, you see going back to 1999 and all the way up to 2014, it really uh, hasn't uh, changed. And, and I think that's a surprising uh, result, but probably a true result, at least as uh, for the way that endarterectomy and angioplasty and stenting are really done in the United States, not how they are done in the very best of hands for either surgery or endovascular treatment. So another um, topic, and again, I think this is one that, that, that may be more important than, you know, how we do our invasive treatment, and that is, should we be doing invasive treatment at all, or should we go with uh, medical management? Um, you know, when you, I was part of the, the, the NASA uh, study, the original study, and what it showed was that there was a marked benefit uh, of endarterectomy for stroke prevention in symptomatic patients, greater than 70% stenosis, and a moderate benefit in patients with 50 to 70% stenosis. Um, the ACAS study uh, showed a modest benefit of uh, endarterectomy for stroke prevention in asymptomatic patients with greater than 60% stenosis. And it was reported that there's no benefit uh, endarterectomy for patients with less than 50% stenosis. And that's not true, but that's what was reported. If you really look at the, the data, here's what it shows. And it's, um, so 
what we're, we're, we're looking at here is stroke prevention by endarectomy at two years. If you look at the NASET data in the very high-grade stenosis group, 17% um, absolute risk reduction if you had an endarterectomy, 67% um, relative risk reduction. You needed to do six operations to prevent one stroke at two years. And of course, the p-value is you know, r ridiculous. Um, if you look in the 50 to 69% stenosis group, uh, an absolute risk reduction of 6.5%, relative risk 29%. Now you need to do 15 operations to prevent one stroke at two years. And because we have a magic number of a p-value less than 0.05, that's significant. So it says, OK, we can do, do this. Um, it's reported that there was no benefit um, in less than 50%. But in fact, if you look at the data, the absolute risk reduction in the 30 to 49% group, 3.8%, a 20% relative risk reduction, you needed to do 26 endarterectomies in that group to prevent one stroke at two years. But because we, by convention, say a p-value has to be less than 0.05, this was not statistically significant. However, what that p-value means is that the, the chance that this amount of difference occurred, you know, by dumb luck, by chance alone, is 16%. But to say there's no evidence that it helps is, is not true. Now compare this to, to the ACAS data. In ACAS, uh, the absolute risk reduction in patients with uh, greater than 60% asymptomatic stenosis was 1.5%, or less than half of the absolute risk reduction in this group. There is a 30% relative risk reduction, but you needed to do 67 operations to prevent one stroke at two years. But because of the way they tortured the data, they got the p-value to come out in less than 0.05. So for many years, we are saying, you know, the data say that the benefit here is twice as much as here, but because of this one number, it's okay to do these asymptomatic patients, and it's not okay to do these symptomatic patients. Uh, that, that's lying with statistics, and, and I think we're, we're um, past that now. Um, one of the things that's really struck me is when I was involved with those earlier studies, you know, best medical management was usually an aspirin. Um, and the, the medical management of asymptomatic carotid stenosis, uh, aggressive use of statins, antiplatelet agents, uh, much tighter blood pressure control. I mean, the medical management is just much different now than it was when those studies were done. And if you look at annual stroke rates in medically managed patients with asymptomatic carotid stenosis, they're under 1% a year. I mean, they're so low, it's going to be hard for any invasive therapy to show a benefit in regards to stroke prevention. Um, there are almost certainly subsets of patients at higher stroke risk, and people have looked at things like transcranial Doppler, detection of clinically silent emboli, uh, rate of progression of stenosis, um, MR evidence of clinically silent infarctions, um, the total atherosclerotic plaque burden, um, plaque uh, characteristics on various kinds of imaging studies, and other criteria in, in trying to say, well, of all of this universe of asymptomatic stenosis, is there a subgroup that really benefits from intervention? And, and there may be, but it hasn't been clearly uh, defined. So that brings us to CREST-2. Uh, CREST-2 conducted with patients who have greater than 70% asymptomatic stenosis uh, is to assess the treatment differences between medical management versus endarterectomy and medical management versus angioplasty and stenting. Um, I think the most interesting piece of this study is the plan to assess differences in cognitive function at four years uh, uh, of follow-up. Um, they're also going to, of course, assess differences in major stroke events at four years. And this study has been designed to assess the effects of age, sex, severity of carotid stenosis, uh, risk factor levels, duration of the asymptomatic period on the primary outcomes measures. We are part of uh, CREST-2. I think it's going to give us some very interesting information and some information that you know, just is 
uh, really not available right now, particularly on the cognitive function. Um, if indeed we can show that uh, uh, revascularization of a highly stenotic uh, internal carotid artery has a protective effect on cognitive function at four years, that just completely changes the landscape because now our indications for surgery are not going to be stroke prevention, they're going to be prevention of dementia. And, and that, I think, is, is a very exciting possibility. I remain uh, very skeptical that we're going to be able to show a benefit of either endarterectomy or angioplasty and stenting um, compared to medical management alone in regard to stroke prevention, but you know, time will tell. Uh, personal experience, I've done more than 2,000 uh, uh, endarterectomies in my lifetime. Um, and, and we started collecting prospective data on this uh, procedure in July of 1990. And before most people, you know, had computerized databases. And, and it's been a, a, you know, very good in regards to uh, uh, publications, but even more important in looking at how some uh, changes in the, the management seem to result in a, a change in the, the outcomes. Uh, all of the outcomes in this database were determined by an evaluator other than the operating surgeon. Um, we had 100% six-week follow-up, most of that with patients coming back to uh, clinic, but if for any reason they couldn't come back to clinic, we had a nurse practitioner contact them uh, via telephone to do the, the follow-up uh, that way. So, um, you know, not a randomized study, but a very good registry. Um, so it, when I look at my data, um, 99 plus percent of the uh, patients uh, were done with a regional anesthetic. Uh, in the original CREST study, 90 percent were done with, with general anesthesia. I am convinced that the, the regional anesthesia does reduce the myocardial infarction rate based on, on, on my data. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, how you do uh, the procedure, whether it's how you do the angioplasty and stenting or how you do the endarterectomy is clearly going to have an effect on the outcomes. Um, I, I've been using um, dual antiplatelet agents for two decades uh, preoperatively. You know, everybody gets uh, aspirin and Plavix before surgery and it's maintained for um, six weeks afterward not even mentioned in um, the endarterectomies in CREST, although it, it's standard treatment to use dual antiplatelet agents for angioplasty and stenting. Uh, what I saw when I started uh, using dual antiplatelet agents, um, it, I started doing these uh, operations with a general anesthesia, um, and um, when I switched to regional anesthesia, it really reduced the complication rate in as far as cardiopulmonary uh, complications, it reduced the length of stay, it reduced urinary retention. There were a lot of positives uh, for switching from general to regional, but it did not change the stroke rate at all, uh, and, and it did not change the, the stroke and death rate uh, at all. Um, but when I switched to using dual antiplatelets, both the MI rate and the stroke rate uh, dropped by about 50%. Yeah. Can I prove that's cause and effect? Yeah. Without the control group, you can't. But I think there is at least reasonable evidence that dual antiplatelet agents um, make sense in the perioperative uh, period. And we did not see an increase in um, our hematomas. Uh, I used to uh, not reverse the heparin when I switched to dual antiplatelet agents. I did reverse the heparin at the end of the procedure, and there is absolutely no change in the, the rate of neck hematoma. Um, so this is just looking at the, the last 500 patients that were done by the end of June 2014. Um, uh, 499 were done using aspirin and, and Plavix. Um, 497 were done with regional anesthesia. Um, the three patients who were not done with regional anesthesia, uh, one was a patient who was deaf, and I think it's really important uh, with regional anesthesia to be able to converse with the patient. One uh, spoke no English, um, and so again, that was done under uh, regional uh, or under general anesthesia. 
And there was only one patient who absolutely refused to have the operation done awake. And of course, it was this, you know, big macho guy, uh, you know, with a lot of gold chains and stuff. And, and he said, no, he absolutely wasn't going to be awake for his, his surgery. But you can do regional anesthesia in almost uh, every patient. 89% um, of these patients were in symptomatic disease. I used to do a lot more asymptomatic stenosis, but as I said, I've become convinced that uh, asymptomatic stenosis is probably not an indication for intervention. Um, there were three perioperative strokes in this group, three perioperative MIs in this group. There were two neck hematomas, one cranial nerve palsy that persisted at six weeks, and one death. And that was actually an aortic dissection uh, following uh, endovascular retrieval of a, a embolus that occurred at the time of surgery. So the, the overall outcome with this group was, was really um, excellent. And, and I think it, it's the kind of thing that you can achieve with um, open surgical uh, treatment. So if the question is endarterectomy versus angioplasty and stenting, I think overall, if either are options, endarterectomy, you know, the, it probably still has a benefit in regard to the perioperative complications. Is that the case at every center? You know, probably not. I'm sure there are plenty of places where the endovascular treatment, because of the people who are doing it, is better than the open surgical treatment because of the people who are doing it. And I think yeah, it, it's really good to have both options. I know at Penn State, we have five um, vascular uh, neurosurgeons, four of whom are dual trained. I'm the dinosaur, I'm not. Um, from the standpoint of uh, aneurysm disease, I mean, we're well over 90% of the aneurysms that are now being done endovascularly. But for carotid disease, the endarterectomy remains the uh, default position. If for some reason it's not a good patient for endarterectomy, it's really nice to have very skilled endovascular neurosurgeons who can do the, the endovascular uh, procedures. Um, if the question is endarterectomy versus medical management in asymptomatic patients, I think the, the answer is we don't know. Um, my suspicion is no intervention is going to beat medical management alone for stroke prevention in the asymptomatic patients, but Crest should help sort that out. Um, the effects of asymptomatic carotid stenosis and revascularization on cognitive function is where I think the most in intriguing uh, question is right now. And I hope Crest gives us some idea if we may actually help prevent um, dementing illness by revascularizing the carotids in these uh, asymptomatic patients. So my conclusions looking at the randomized trial data, the registry data, and my personal experience that endarterectomy remains the best option overall to uh, remove the source of the artery to artery emboli that are the cause of stroke of, uh, in symptomatic carotid artery stenosis. Uh, I think that based on both the RCT and registry data, endarterectomy is superior to angioplasty and stenting um, in those patients. And, but once again, you know, that's not the case at, at every institution and having both options, I think, is, is essential. Um, and then whether any invasive therapy for asymptomatic carotid artery stenosis is better than medical management alone is under investigation, but I am a skeptic. So thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, once again, I appreciate the opportunity to present. Uh, thank you, Jacques. Thanks so much, uh, Bob, for this uh, overall look at it. I mean, very few people understand the topic as deeply as you do, and uh, I'm sure the participants appreciated this uh, quick overview of the, of the main topics. Uh, so I'll invite John to unmute his microphone and share his slides and tell us uh, maybe perhaps more the technical aspects of, of the surgery, how he does it. And for the participants, go ahead, please, as you think of questions, submit them to the Q&A box so we can address them at the end. Thanks, John.
Okay, Th thank you, Jacques. Thanks for uh, inviting me to participate. This is uh, is terrific. Uh, Bob uh, Harbaugh is always a, a hard act to follow. Bob, that was great. Thanks for for sharing your experience and and uh, all the data on the trials. Um, I'll try to share a little bit about um, our experience here at Wake Forest, which I think is is fairly similar um, to to that at um, at Penn State. Obviously, Bob's series is uh, is second to none. That is. Uh, an amazing body of work that he has uh, accomplished with a prospective analysis of it to boot. So that is, is really terrific. But I'll talk a little bit about how we uh, do things here at uh, Wake Forest and uh, talk about some of our results and how to uh, try to avoid some complications. Um, John, click on the slide and then you can advance. Okay, thanks. Oh, perfect. So again, I have nothing, uh, no relevant relationships with commercial interests to disclose, no discussion of non-FDA approved or off-label use of drugs or devices will uh, occur in this talk. So the, the Wake Forest uh, endarterectomy protocol is uh, again using a regional anesthetic. We use a superficial cervical plexus block along a sternocleidomastoid. Um, my experience before coming to Wake Forest, it was similar to Bob's where I did, we're, we're doing all my endarterectomies uh, under general anesthesia with um, uh, full montage EEG monitoring. Came here and, and uh, talked to an, an older neuro uh, anesthesiologist and said, you know, you ought to really look into this, uh, doing some of these awake. He said, patients just seem to do great. And, um, you know, once I started seeing, you know, really just how well the patients did uh, with an awake uh, endarterectomy, how quickly they got out of the hospital, um, how, how much better they felt post-operatively, it, it really never looked back. Um, it allows for careful neurologic monitoring, uh, obviously, because you can uh, basically are able to um, continuously perform a, a, a neurologic exam, which is about the most sensitive uh, means of monitoring. We do a primary uh, closure of the arteriotomy, except in the case of a restenosis, which we rarely operate on anymore, or a native vessel that is less than three millimeters in size. Um, we uh, monitor all the patients in the ICU postoperatively. Um, they may be there from between eight to 12 hours post-op and then 95% the, uh, of them are discharged the following morning. So in terms of looking at the uh, regional versus general anesthesia, th there's really um, been uh, a lot of papers written about this, a lot of research done uh, into it. Uh, there was in fact a, a uh, a um, landmark paper published in Lancet that was, was the results of a randomized trial looking at general anesthesia versus local anesthesia for carotid surgery. Over 3,500 patients were enrolled. And again, their primary outcome measures was a composite endpoint of stroke, MI, or death within 30 days. And on the basis of this trial, they really could find no con conclusive data supporting either method of anesthesia. But Despite that, there were uh, continued to be numerous uh, anecdotal reports and case series that seemed to indicate a, a benefit to uh, regional anesthesia. Um, one of the a, a more recent publication, and I think one of the, the most informative publications on the subject, was published in Stroke last December, uh, looking at associations of perioperative variables with a 30-day risk of stroke or death in carotid endarterectomy in symptomatic patients. And this, was, uh, this came from the carotid, carotid stenosis trialist collaboration where they pooled the data from these five trials. And as a result of that, over 4,000 patients were analyzed. You can see that um, the majority of them had general anesthesia, but there were over 1,300 that uh, had undergone uh, local anesthesia. Primary outcome in this uh, analysis was any stroke and 30-day mortality. And what they found was that there was a, a local anesthesia was associated with a lower primary outcome rate uh, with an adjusted relative uh, risk of 0.7. And you can see the confidence interval there. So again, this was uh, sort of the, the first study to, to um, show a clear cut and statistically significant benefit to uh, local anesthesia over general anesthesia in terms of outcomes. Um, now, one of the benefits of a, of a local anesthetic is uh, the ability to have a, a, a careful neurologic exam, which allows you to detect early on any changes, uh, potentially perfusion-related changes in the patient's neurologic exam. 
And this allows us to perform selective shunting uh, on our patients. We uh, only shunt those patients who have a change in mental status or develop a focal neurologic deficit that is refractory to uh, elevations in their blood pressure and improved perfusion. When we do do a shunt, we use the Pruitt and Hara shunt, which you see here. Uh, it has the soft elastic catheter with balloons uh, that are captured with a, um, a, uh, uh, a vessel loop uh, that holds it in place. It can be back bled and then, um, and then uh, reperfused in the case where the patient develops neurologic symptoms. Um, so the, again, the question of selective versus empiric shunting is one that has been talked about a lot. And uh, selective shunting does require some sort of careful assessment and, uh, to, in order to determine which patients will require uh, reperfusion during the procedure. Again, there hasn't been conclusive data to support either method, but um, looking back at the, um, at the trial that was published in Stroke, uh, one of the, th this is a, a forest plot looking at um, the results from that previous trial I'd mentioned. And one of the uh, key points you can see here is that there was a, uh, a statistically significantly worse outcome rate in those patients who uh, were shunted as opposed to those who were not shunted. So I, I do think that there's uh, some, some good evidence to support the use of selective shunting. And uh, a wake end arterectomy does give you, I think, in my opinion, the most sensitive means of determining which patient uh, ought to have an intraoperative shunt. Um, so in terms of uh, the preoperative evaluation, um, years ago we had uh, done cerebral angiography on, on virtually all of our patients, but it is an invasive procedure that carries some inherent risk. We have pretty much uniformly uh, switched to CT angiography. CT angiography gives you the same sort of, um, uh, of roadmap and the same sort of, uh, of anatomic correlation that I find very useful in the, uh, in the procedure, yet does it in a non-invasive and uh, low-risk way. You really see the morphology of the plaque very well. You can see the calcification in it. You can localize the, the uh, location of the disease um, very carefully in the neck, which has afforded us the ability to, to um, uh, try to improve the cosmesis of the procedure by doing a, uh, a transverse, uh, fairly small incision. This is the um, positioning of the patient. Um, we create sort of a tunnel here so that the anesthesiologist will have direct access to the patient's face, be able to talk to them and perform the, the neurologic exam throughout the procedure. Um, the local anesthetic is just a superficial block along the sternocleidomastoid that, um, that anesthetizes the superficial plexus of nerves. You can see these nerves run uh, right um, uh, subcutaneously over top of the uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle. Those cutaneous nerves are um, basically cut once you do your dissection along the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which accounts for the, the uh, diminished sensation on the superior aspect of the incision that tends to last for uh, between uh, six to nine months on patients um, after the procedure. Uh, but we find that very effective. And then we supplement um, by injection in the carotid sheet once we're directly down visualizing the carotid artery, uh, which helps avoid hematomas or direct injection uh, into the vessel. You can see that we do a transverse incision here. It, it generally is um, in the range of around a, a, a six to seven millimeter length or a centimeter length incision uh, that is necessary for the procedure. Uh, sometimes with high bifurcations that has to be extended uh, somewhat. Um, this uh, slide is a how do I go backwards, Jacques? Okay, this uh, slide is a demonstration of the uh, initial exposure. This is the common facial vein. This is the a sternocleidomastoid artery. This is a fairly robust appearance of this artery, but it is a, a commonplace artery that um, runs and can tether down the, the hypoglossal nerve. Uh, this artery can be uniformly sacrificed um, and uh, it runs over to the, the muscle uh, or a chain of lymph nodes. And once you do, you're able to mobilize the hypoglossal nerve much more effectively. Um, to me, the, the key uh, to, to dealing with a high bifurcation is the dissection between 
the uh, posterior belly, the digastric muscle, and the sternocleidomastoid. Um, working in this angle and getting that all the way to the skull base really can give you access to the distal internal carotid virtually all the way to the skull base. So, you know, we talk about hostile necks and that being a, a reason for uh, carotid stenting. A high bifurcation in, in our experience is virtually never really a contraindication to uh, carotid uh, endarterectomy um, because you really can expose the carotid uh, uh, virtually to the, the skull base. So it's only if that bifurcation is so high that it's gonna be difficult to get distal control that we would uh, consider converting to uh, um, a uh, carotid stent. Um, we have uh, some specialized retractors. This is called a, a Haney retractor that seem to uh, assist with the exposure of those high bifurcations as well. It can retract the uh, posterior belly, the digastric muscle um, uh, out of the way very carefully. You do have to be somewhat uh, cautious because if you pull this up uh, underneath the angle of the mandible, you can get a marginal mandibular uh, paresis of the facial nerve. When you see those there um, almost uniformly uh, um, get better on their own without any intervention, but it is uh, bothersome to the patient for a period of time. Um, this is the, uh, the, when we, once we've uh, exposed the carotid, um, I generally expose, particularly in symptomatic patients, expose the just the internal and the um, common carotid without disturbing the carotid bifurcation or the plaque much at all. Um, we have our um, uh, umbilical tapes in place that would allow us to capture the fruit and horror shunt if, if necessary. And then the, the first thing we do is heparinize the patient and place the distal clip on prior to dissecting out the bifurcation. This uh, we found can, you know, we have at times monitor transcranial Dopplers on these patients while we're doing the procedure and um, have found that uh, the, the number of hits distally um, by doing this maneuver prior to uh, manipulation of the carotid bifurcation has been very effective in, uh, in uh, embolizing the number of, uh, of hits that we would see on a transcranial Doppler. So we think it's potentially beneficial uh, in terms of minimizing the, the risk of perioperative complications. Uh, but once we place that, you know, we're monitoring the patient, so uh, we, we will know uh, very quickly if they're developing symptoms, and it's at that point that we dissect out the, the uh, bifurcation and uh, place the vessel loop on the external carotid and its branches. Um, okay, let's So the, um, the endarterectomy itself, I prefer um, an, an extra plaque dissection, uh, which you'll see here. That has allowed us to take the plaques out um, on block, which has uh, permitted us to do a lot of uh, uh, interesting research on the, the plaques. We've uh, um, done some analysis of the uh, uh, mRNA of the um, uh, endothelial cells within the, and the cap cells within the plaque. Um, as you can see, this plaque will go all the way down um, to the uh, aorta. So at some point you have to amputate it, um, but it's with the direction of flow approximately, so there's no problem there. Where we spend a lot more um, time and attention to detail is at the distal end. And so uh, this transition between the endarterectomy site and the normal appearing distal intima is something I really spend a lot of time on uh, to get a nice smooth plane of transition. Virtually never place tacking sutures, have not found that necessary. You just really have to get up uh, beyond the area of stenosis and pay a lot of attention to get a, a very clean um, transition between the endarterectomy site and the, um, and the uh, distal intima. So um, we do a primary uh, closure. Uh, this is what the, the closure looks like. We, um, with this sort of uh, fine suturing technique, I don't think a patch is necessary. Uh, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with a patch. Many people do that and it um, allows you to, um, it, you don't have to be as particular about the suture line, but we have not found um, particular problems with re-stenosis uh, despite not using a patch. So in terms of our results, uh, looked at this, um, 
probably 10 years ago when we uh, presented at the International Stroke Conference, we were uh, interested in looking at our outcomes relative to components of the crest and posit endpoint and outcomes in patients uh, with contralateral carotid occlusion uh, in particular. Uh, we had not seemed to find the, the, the increased risk uh, that other centers had demonstrated with contralateral carotid occlusion, so we we're specifically interested in looking at that. We did a retrospective uh, analysis of 535 consecutive procedures um, the, that uh, 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 patients that were undergoing uh, carotid endarterectomy, um, including those with contralateral carotid occlusion. We looked at the complication rates and the impact of shunting on the overall uh, outcome and the rate of, uh, of shunting relative to uh, whether or not they had contralateral carotid uh, stenosis or occlusion, excuse me. <clears throat> so the, the demographics of our patients were, as you see here, pretty, sim uh, uh, pretty uh, uh, typical. And uh, there was no difference in these between those patients with contralateral carotid occlusion and those without. Um, group one were the contralateral carotid occlusion patients. There were 51 cases. 58% uh, of those were uh, asymptomatic. Um, in, in group two, there was no contralateral uh, carotid occlusion, 484 cases, 50% uh, uh, of those uh, asymptomatic. Um, we have also probably do far less asymptomatic patients nowadays um, than uh, previously and are participating in CREST 2. I really think CREST 2 is, is going to answer an important question in regards to those asymptomatic patients. And, we try to enroll uh, all of our asymptomatic patients uh, in, into CREST II. Um, so in, um, in terms of the anesthesia, you can see that in the um, group one, uh, eight of 51 uh, cases had a general anesthesia. The uh, thing about that is that six of those were conversions from uh, regional anesthesia to general anesthesia. And, and there's a subset of patients uh, with contralateral carotid occlusion that when you cross clamp the internal carotid, they immediately develop profound neurologic deficit. Um, in, in my hands where I very infrequently do um, a, a, an indwelling shunt, it, it takes a good five or six minutes for me to get a shunt in and get it flowing, um, particularly in a point where the, and, um, the artery has not even been opened yet may take longer than that. So in those patients who developed the very profound symptoms, our, our uh, method had been to remove the internal clamp, reestablish flow, get them back to their neurologic baseline. And then we would, um, w knowing that we were going to put a shunt in those patients, we would put them under general anesthesia so that we could use uh, neuroprotection during that period of time that they would be ischemic until we got the shunt in place. And that was six of the, um, um, uh, eight patients that had general anesthesia in this smaller uh, group one series. In group two of the 480 patients, 10 of those uh, cases had general, and these were the indications that we saw for uh, general anesthesia, uh, sort of the same uh, things that, that Bob had mentioned. Very, very few, and it's become even much less uh, in our more um, recent patients. So it was uh, interesting that we found uh, that the, still the vast majority of patients, even with a contralateral carotid occlusion, tolerated cross clamp without neurologic symptoms. 77% of the patients uh, had no problems with uh, cross clamping. Uh, even greater in uh, those with an open uh, carotid on the contralateral side, where 97% of those tolerated cross clamp without uh, any development of symptoms. Our complication rate was fairly low. We had a 1% medical complication rate, perioperative stroke or death of 1.2%, uh, um, permanent cranial nerve paresis in 1% uh, overall. We had uh, one unfortunate uh, circumstance of a vocal cord paralysis, one permanent marginal mandibular, had no instances of a hypoglossal uh, nerve palsy, relatively low incidence of wound hematoma or, or infection. One thing which I um, intended to um, mention, which I had not, was our um, antiplatelet um, uh, protocol. We treat all the patients with 650 milligrams of aspirin, um, if they're, unless they are uh, preoperatively on uh, dual antiplatelets, in which case we uh, maintain the dual antiplatelets through surgery. 
Um, that was, it was found in the NASA trial that, uh, that doses of aspirin less than 650 milligrams were one of the factors that led to an increased risk of perioperative uh, stroke. I, I think the reason for this is, is that um, w w there are, is an incidence of aspirin non-response that I believe is dose dependent. And so the vast majority of people, probably over 80% of people will respond adequately to a dose of aspirin of 81 milligrams. But in the remaining 20% who may be considered non-responders at that dose, if you increase the dose, you will uh, significantly increase the number of responders. So that getting to a dose of 650 milligrams, you probably get in the very high 90% um, in terms of the percentage of patients who are, are responding to aspirin and having their uh, platelet uh, aggregation adequately blocked to prevent postoperative complications. Um, and uh, so that has been our uh, protocol with that, but I think the dual antiplatelets, as mentioned by Dr. Harbaugh, would be uh, if not more, equally if not more effective. So what we found is that patients with contralateral carotid occlusion are much more likely to develop symptoms of cerebral ischemia that would require carotid shunting, uh, but still the majority of them will not. Uh, endarterectomy under regional anesthesia with selective uh, shunting can be accomplished with an acceptable morbidity mortality. Uh, Crest demonstrated equivalency of uh, endarterectomy and carotid stenting, but as Bob pointed out in his talk, um, there that may have had uh, more to do with the uh, selection of the composite endpoint than the specific outcomes, uh, particularly as it relates to stroke. Um, so when you look at those um, values, you can see here that um, there are very significant differences um, in, the, um, in the components of the composite endpoint. So stroke was significantly favored uh, for uh, endarterectomy versus uh, stenting, whereas MI was significantly favored for um, uh, uh, stenting as opposed to endarterectomy. Again, this may have had something to do with the selection of anesthetic techniques as 90% of the um, endarterectomies in Crest were done under general anesthesia, whereas uh, none of the stent uh, procedures were done under general anesthesia. Um, again, it uh, held true for periprocedure major ipsilateral stroke, four-year major ipsilateral stroke. You can see that uh, that stroke, um, the stroke outcome significantly favored uh, carotid endarterectomy, um, uh, whereas obviously cranial nerve palsy would significantly favor carotid stenting. So um, again, uh, not too much more to say about Crest. I think Bob covered that very, uh, uh, very sufficiently. Um, we uh, are participating in Crest too, and we hope that it will um, supply some additional uh, insight into the management of asymptomatic patients. But I do uh, agree with Bob that I have a great deal of skepticism that uh, any intervention is going to um, necessarily beat um, the, the treatment of asymptomatic carotid stenosis, particularly when you base it, your patient selection purely on degree of stenosis. I think ultimately we're going to become much smarter about selecting patients and we'll, we'll identify those risk factors that um, uh, put patients at, at higher risk and we'll be able to more selectively intervene on the appropriate patients. So in terms of complication avoidance, um, preoperatively it's all about patient selection, um, whether or not they have a contralateral occlusion, a hostile neck, uh, appropriate antiplatelet medication as, we, as we've talked about. Uh, intraoperative, it's, um, it's monitoring changes in the patient's neurologic condition, uh, changes in mental status or focal deficit related to hyperperfusion can in a, in a significant percentage of patients um, be reversed by blood pressure elevation. Uh, otherwise, we would go on with shunt placement. I, I think careful inspection of the distal endarterectomy site and assurance of back bleeding is critical. And uh, really, we will, we will follow the plaque up as far as is necessary to really get to a smooth transition point uh, as opposed to placing tacking sutures or, or things such as that. Uh, in the post-operative period, um, ICU observation for close blood pressure monitoring is, um, I think, very important uh, and also allows for early recognition of wound complications. What we found with the um, patients under 
uh, regional anesthesia is that the majority of them, if they have blood pressure problems, it's with reflex um, hypotension. And uh, many of these patients are requiring blood pressure support uh, in the first eight to 12 hours postoperatively. Um, this is a, a demonstration of an intraoperative shunt complication. Uh, this is a patient became um, uh, um, profoundly weak on their contralateral side. We placed the Pruitt and Hara shunt. Um, one of the things about that shunt that you have to be very careful of is paying close attention to uh, the, the balloons that are attached to the, um, uh, or the syringes that are attached to the balloons that are inflated. Uh, within the artery. And unfortunately, um, in, our, in, in my haste to place this, I wasn't paying close enough attention to the syringe that was placed on the uh, 1cc balloon in the distal end. Uh, the resident blew that up uh, fully with about uh, 5 cc's, really overexpanded um, or, uh, the, the vessel tremendously, created this dissection and pseudoaneurysm. You can see that was uh, successfully treated um, later with a, uh, an indwelling stent. This is the two-year follow-up period, and you can see they've developed a recurrent stenosis um, that, that was treated with a stent as well. Um, that's uh, generally, if we have recurrent stenosis, that is um, uh, the way that we treat it is with uh, uh, endovascularly. We generally do not re-operate. Um, it can be uh, a, a good bit more difficult to, uh, to re-operate. Um, wanted to uh, demonstrate uh, again a, um, uh, a circumstance in which um, uh, a patient had developed a, uh, a carotid occlusion between the time of their study and when they um, presented for their endarterectomy. Uh, it looked like it was a fairly um, fresh occlusion or relatively fresh occlusion. We um, tried to uh, uh, use a Fogarty catheter to re-establish the carotid flow. We're unsuccessful in doing that in this case, but you'll see the demonstration of that. And you'll see the demonstration again of how we do the extra plaque dissection and are able to um, uh, get the plaque out on block. Um, so here you can see it just kind of came out of the internal, the, the telltale sign of that organized thrombus. Um, we have no back bleeding uh, going on here, trying to pass a uh, Fogarty catheter up uh, to the skull base, pass it up about uh, 10 centimeters here to try to get into the petrous portion, um, blow up the balloon, and try to deliver a clot back. But if it's, if it's beyond the skull base um, or is more chronically occluded, uh, uh, trying to do more than that um, without having, um, you know, angiographic control, I think really risks the uh, developing uh, distal embolic complications. So this was uh, unsuccessful, uh, ended up just uh, over the stump and um, they were not able to reestablish that uh, carotid flow there. So with So with that, uh, I will conclude and uh, be happy to take any questions from the Great. chat room. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and for the participants, you can see how volume and experience counts. Obviously, both uh, John and Bob are extremely experienced and those low morbidity numbers are very hard to replicate unless you do a fair amount of, of endarterectomies. So while I'll I'll, maybe I'll ask Bernard to load his case while he's doing that. I'd like to squeeze in one question from the audience. Uh, I'll ask, uh, Bob, I'll ask you this question by Dr. Stephen Cohn. Uh, here is the question. Since, uh, uh, and, and Bernard, go ahead and you can uh, share the slides. Since it is unlikely that CA or stenting for asymptomatic patients improves long-term outcome, but maybe associated with more adverse effects peri-op. How can I, as a medical consultant, convince surgeons and anesthesiologists not to screen for carotid stenosis or refer patients um, with asymptomatic stenosis for prophylactic intervention prior to non-cardiac, uh, non-neurologic surgery? 
the risk of periop stroke in non-cardiac surgery in a patient with no prior CVA is less than 1%, which cannot really be improved by an intervention. Well, well, how would you answer his question, Bob? Well, one, I think if, if, if you're asking how can you get people not to do it, I, I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, I, I think we, we generally are very poor at risk assessment, and so we, we look at a, a narrow carotid for that was you know study obtained for whatever reason, and you know uh, we go into our treatment mode and say well we should fix that before we do this other surgery. I completely agree with the, the questioner that that there's no data to say that that makes any sense to to do that, and. Um, the only thing I, I, I hope is if indeed we have a very reliable study like CREST-2 that says, you know, uh, overall intervening for asymptomatic stenosis doesn't improve stroke outcomes, that that data will then be applied to these other situations. That's my hope, but I've become somewhat uh, cynical. It can be very hard to, to change. Uh, treatment patterns once um, they become established. Uh, thanks. John, the other half of this question I'll post to you also from Stephen Cohn. What is your opinion about screening for and intervening for a carotid artery stenting prior to cabbage? Or, or maybe you can answer the interplay of cabbage and, and, and carotid surgery or carotid screening. What, 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 what's your position on that? Sure. So, well, well, I think screening in general, there's a difference between screening and needing to uh, intervene procedurally with, um, based on the results of the screening. And so I think screening is a very good thing because uh, knowing that you have carotid disease and managing the risk factors and appropriately uh, uh, having the aggressive medical treatment that is necessary can, can dramatically reduce the risk of stroke. You know, Bob was talking about non-cardiac uh, or non-vascular procedures, and and there not being a um, any potential or any recognized benefit to prophylactic uh, carotid um, endarterectomy or or any kind of carotid intervention in that situation is uh, is certainly true. But the the data when it comes to cabbage and those uh, coronary interventions where they're going on uh, bypasses is, is somewhat different. And there may be uh, some benefit in, in that circumstance. I'm not uh, tremendously uh, familiar with that cabbage literature. I don't know if, if Bob has something else to say uh, about that, but I'd be uh, interested if he's, if he's particularly familiar with that literature in, in the cabbage population. Yeah, I, I actually wrote a paper about that many uh, years ago, um, sort of mid '90s, um, looking at you know uh, endarterectomy and cabbage done, you know, simultaneously. Do the endarterectomy and go right to the cabbage staged. Uh, don't do the endarterectomy, and, and actually, you can make a case for prophylactic endarterectomy at that time. Uh, but again, what's different now? is the, uh, the, the state of medical management, both perioperatively for the, the cabbage, and uh, as you pointed out, John, you know, the aggressive, really aggressive treatment of risk factors. And, and the landscape has really changed for uh, stroke prevention from medical management alone. So I would not do that now, even though I wrote a paper you know, 25 years ago that said that was, you know, uh, the right thing to do. I, I don't think there's uh, a good indication for intervention in asymptomatic carotid stenosis in general, although I continue to do a very small number of, of very specific patients, uh, young, rapidly progressive stenosis, uh, someone who the neurologists have found uh, has um, a, a, a embolic hits on transcranial Doppler, but but you know that's the, the the very very small subset of the asymptomatic stenosis. In general, I think they're not patients who need to be treated invasively. 
So Thanks, the, Bob. Like one comment, Jock. So the thing, it really depends on who's treating the, 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 the carotid disease. If you look at like our, at Methus, which is a large heart center, our cardiologists do the stenting, you know, of both the coronaries and the carotids in a large the volume. So when those guys get evaluated, I can promise you every patient that gets a coronary evaluation at Houston Methodist gets a carotid evaluation by the, by the, by the uh, cardiologist to make sure they don't get to us. So, I mean, that's no doubt about it. Depends on the situation. I think in, with neurosurgeons, like your pro program runs most of those cases, it's different. But in our center, those cardiologists are extremely aggressive. Oh, yeah. We, we refer to those as uh, drive-by stentings. Um, and, and, and there are practitioners in our area, not in our institution, who, you know, as far as I can tell, the, the indications for angioplasty and stenting are carotid in situ. I mean, if there's any possible reason to talk people into a stent, they'll, they'll get it. And you're exactly right. If they do the coronaries, well, why not throw one in the carotid as well? Okay, Bernard, your show for now. You're muted, Bernard. Un you're still yeah, muted. I, I see. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, Dr. Marcos, I want to thank you for the honor and privilege of uh, being part of this uh, incredible symposium. You've set a new standards. To use your analogies, uh, you raised a phoenix out of the COVID fires to, to set a new standard of educating, sharing, and inspiring. So thank you. And also want to thank Dr. Harbaugh, Dr. Wilson, incredible talks. It's, uh, I feel a little embarrassed to follow you, but what I brought here today is just a very simple, simple, but very interesting case. There are no tricks here. I'll, uh, it's just a very, uh, it's a bit off the beaten path, a little different. Uh, I know I wouldn't have anything to add to Dr. Harbaugh, Dr. Wilson's talk from an endorectomy, uh, or carotid, uh, you know, uh, standard carotid standpoint, but I, I, I this is sort of a, out of left field a little bit. So this is a 45-year-old uh, gentleman, a bit obese, right-handed, uh, referred for progressive asymptomatic bilateral ICA stenosis. He has hypertension, uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, he had a coronary angioplasty two years, and stenting two years prior. And um, if I can get this to advance. So he has, you know, bilateral carotid stenosis, looked very severe on both sides. We, we pinned our excellent radiologists down. They, they, they thought that the left was a little bit more stenotic. This picture actually may not show the nuances of that, but based on their axial imaging, they thought the left maybe was a little bit worse, but it was a toss-up. So um, perhaps uh, anybody from the panel, Dr. Harbaugh, Dr. Wilson, what would you do in this case? Yeah, I think this would be one of the exceptions that I talked about. Very young, um, you know, uh, you don't know the rapidity of progression, but at 45, it must have progressed fairly fast to be uh, looking like that. And the bilateral nature, I think, is concerning, too. So this is one of those exceptions where uh, I, I would go ahead and probably do um, the, the left carotid first and then, um, you know, wait six weeks and do the right one. Uh, 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 I feel good because that's exactly what I did. Um, we did a left and a direct me. I went well, no problems. Uh, six weeks post, and our plan, my plan was to bring him back six to eight weeks later and do the other side. Mm -hmm. But he comes back six weeks later. Um, unfortunately, he didn't call me when he started having symptoms, but uh, for, with about 24 hours of, of uh, uh, facial droop and hemi, uh, left hemiparesis. Uh, MRI showed an acute MR showed a, a right temporal infarct, no evidence of hemorrhage, sort of a small to medium-sized infarct. MR angio also done acutely suggested right ICA occlusion, which I thought maybe was artifact. We admitted him to the ICU and we got an angiogram because I was worried we weren't sure what was going on. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the right ICA was occluded. So the opposite, the other side from the endorectomy we had done. And uh, the our endorectomy set looked excellent, uh, no, no uh, significant issues there. What was very interesting is he has a hypoplastic left A1, um, uh, but you, see, you can see some collateral here across the midline uh, to the right ICA, supraclinal ICA right here. I don't know if you can see that very easily, but it's right there. And what's interesting is his uh, uh, external carotid on the occluded side was um, showing a lot of collateral to the carotid and his 
the right hemisphere was filling in part from this uh, modest uh, PCOM. And again, here on the left, on the right here, you see the collateral across the midline. So we admitted him to ICU and um, he's about maybe 24 to 36 hours out now from his symptoms. He's got a medium, and I'm sorry, I don't have the MR that shows the infarct, but he has a small to medium infarct, frontal lobe infarct. Um, Perhaps, Dr. Wilson, what would you do in this case? Sorry, before he answers, Bernard, how many days after your uh, surgery this is? Uh, six weeks. O already six weeks, okay. So he, he did great for six weeks, uh, and now he comes in with symptoms from, or a stroke from the contralateral, the unoperated right. Right. carotid. Right, yeah, yeah. This is about, almost, we were about to book him for the second endarterectomy. John? Now, so one one point I would make is uh, is that you know I, I always would prior to doing the second side in a person with bilateral stenosis uh, recheck either an ultrasound or a, a CTA or something because you, you can you can see you, you can even in very rare circumstances see asymptomatic ipsilateral occlusion at the site of your surgery you can see the contralateral problems that you've demonstrated here but this this fellow you know, really looks like he has sort of misery perfusion into that hemisphere. I definitely would want to do something to, to um, get a sense of just kind of perfusion, how much perfusion he has uh, in the right hemisphere. Either do, um, you know, some kind of CT perfusion scan or uh, potentially do transcranial Dopplers, uh, possibly with a CO2 challenge, see what kind of cerebrovascular reserve he has on that side. But, but to me, it looks like he really, you, you never see in any of these uh, circumstances where he's really filling it out well. Um, what did his, uh, can you go back and show me the bifurcation there on the right so side? Is, uh, yeah, the right side, this is the uh, now stump and the uh, yeah. stenotic, he's got a high grade external stenosis right here. Yeah, so- John, you know, to be the devil's advocate, does it matter? It, it does, he's stroked and his carotid has occluded freshly. Would those tests you want to order, would they change your mind what you might do? Yeah, so, you know, here there's, he doesn't fill back to the skull base. It's been a few days. I, I don't think I would uh, try to reopen the internal carotid. Um, the, the question is, you know, whether or not what you could do to try to Im improve perfusion in that hemisphere if, if perfusion is significantly um, impacted. I mean, if he, if he just had it through an emb embolus when he had the stroke, when he occluded the carotid, but has great perfusion, then, then he might not think you need to do anything. But with that, um, with it, look like, it looks like a lot of uh, his perfusion coming through that external carotid, and it being such, such a tight stenosis, I mean, I think you need to do, you'll likely need to do something to um, open up the external carotid, see if you can improve collaterals, but also so that you would have a reasonable flow through an STA if you ended up having to do a, a bypass on the patient. So Bernard, I know if you showed this case to, to, to the Buffalo group, they would describe this as a potential pseudo occlusion and they would take the patient down to the angel suite and try and open it up. Yeah. And I think that if you, I, I don't know where Sadiq is, but I guarantee yeah. he's he here. He's here. Oh, yeah, he would, I guarantee you, they would go inside. I've tried opening it up. Um, I have yet to be successful. Maybe I'm not as good endovascular guys as those guys, but I think that, you know, in a fresh occlusion, and this guy is borderline, he needs something done. And I would, this is a guy I would take down to angiogram and prove that he's not a pseudo occlusion and try and open him up and stent him. So this is one I would take to the OR, and I think you have a very good chance of reopening that carotid, and, and it's, it's a low-risk procedure. Um, and I just, again, looking through my database, we've done uh, 127 complete occlusions. Um, uh, the, the, the group that we could initially reopen was about 60%, just a little more than that. A couple of them re-occluded, uh, so the, the long-term keeping them open was 58%. But the important thing was in that group, there were no perioperative strokes, because if you can't get it open, 
you know, you just do a, a formal, um, you know, ligation of the internal carotid and an external uh, endarterectomy and, and common to external angioplasty. But I think you, you'd have a very high likelihood of reopening this internal carotid if you took them to the OR. So here's the issue, uh, Jacques. I think the key issue here is what John mentioned, and that is, are the hits that the patient have simply embolic or do they reflect a hypoperfuse state? Because we don't have a vertebral injection. We don't know how good a flow this person has. He has, he, there is a vertebral. Yeah, yeah there's a vertebral. The, the vertebral, right the oh, there it is, yes. So the question is, if you have an MRI which shows watershed infarct, that completes my workup and would suggest that this guy is hypoperfused. If you, otherwise you could do CT perfusion with them without Diamox, you could de, do TCD breath holding index. Let's assume that the patient has no vascular compromise, does not have watershed infox, has good vascular reserve on the imaging. I would leave this patient alone and, and that's the end of it because the person had embolic terminal events and so, while we might feel better opening it, however, if there is vascular compromise, you could open it a whole bunch of different ways. I, I uh, agree with Gavin. If you look at the lateral, you can see the retrograde contrast from the external injection coming almost all the way back on the lateral view to the petrocervical junction, which means you could endovascularly reopen it. You could also do it, reopen it the way Dr. Harbaugh is talking about, going to the OR and doing the Fogarty the way John showed it. Interestingly, one other option that I'm sure is what Bernard did here. Stent the ostium of the external. So let, let me add, uh, this is a fascinating discussion. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, let me add one detail that I left out purposefully. He was highly pressure dependent. So um, there you go. Uh, so here, um, we have to keep his pressure above 170. Uh, Anytime you drop below one, even if you moved him off the bed, he would become symptomatic. So he was highly pressure dependent. Uh, and to Dr. Wilson's request, uh, this is the MR perfusion. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, I don't have the, 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 uh, the, the, the stroke MR, the, the, the diffusion uh, hit, uh, but it was a medium sized stroke in the frontal lobe. Uh, and this was the mean transit time. And so he had significant hypoperfusion. Uh, and so at this point, uh, Adnan, what do you think? What you so, just said? Yeah, so from my standpoint, I think um, we would take him to angiography um, and see how bad, uh, big of retrograde flow he has. I like to open these with the MoMA system. MoMA allows you to do basically what you do with an endotrectomy, put a balloon in the external put a balloon in the common, and then cross the lesion. If you are able to cross the lesion successfully, then we go ahead and plasty and stent and aspirate and then confirm with an IVUS that everything is good before restoring enterograde flow. That's the best way to do it. If I'm unable to cross the lesion, if I'm unable to do it, then I would close this person and consider either an external stent, which would be needed if you want to do an STMCA bypass, um, those are the ways I would approach it. Yeah, sort of the things that were on my mind is this medium-sized stroke seen on MR, and I'm sorry I don't have it. I'm sorry for the overhead there. Sorry, give me one second here. Thank you. Sorry, that was a male overhead about masks. Um, uh, anyway, so the, uh, my concern was the medium-sized stroke, and I debated whether to try to open the artery versus the, what you mentioned, a non-stent uh, the external and I chose to stent the external. Uh, and uh, this is him after, this is the external stented open. And very interesting, dramatic improvement in perfusion and almost immediately came off pressors, uh, essentially immediately, with dramatic improvement from this collateral to the hemisphere. My thought was, you know, start with this and then maybe down the road do an STAMC bypass if he still had needed more flow. Not saying this was the right approach, but just the approach I took in the heat of battle uh, with this patient. He did well, uh, I have this, um, this is- Bernard, this can, I, yeah, yeah. can I ask you, why, why don't you think of this as a very delayed or an extreme diffuse or dawn patient with these delayed thrombectomies? You said it's 36 hours out. 
Uh, yeah. I've heard of, I've seen papers out of Japan and so forth that they do yeah. chronic occlusion. Uh, uh, this was from a couple of years ago. Uh, and again, I'm just telling you what, what was going through my mind at the time. I, I, I think uh, the diffusion perfusion mismatch would have been very legitimate to open the carotid. Again, I'm not saying this was the only way to do this. This is just how we did it. Um, I think it would have been, I think what Dr. Harbaugh said, what Adnan said about opening the carotid would have also been a very uh, acceptable option. Um, so I, I, I don't dispute that at all. And I think Don, as to your point, Don uh, reinforces that. I think that no, that notion, which this was before Don, but nonetheless, I think many of us were Don believers before Don came out. So, yeah. uh, but this is just his fault. He did well, uh, was discharged, uh, doing well. This is uh, the the perfusion deficits here on the right were areas of infarct. So we, we normalized this perfusion. Never wound up needing a bypass, but I had that in mind as a as a delayed option. So anyway, not the only way to manage this, but just. I like this case because I think it brings out some uh, sort of issues about yeah, great colla case. collateral and also EC to IC collateral, et cetera. So uh, I thought it would be interesting to show. Thanks, Bernard. Fantastic. Adnan, let's have you show your case. Excellent. I'll stop sharing here. You have the best backgrounds there, Bernard. Between yeah, the, the Monet yes, makes me happy during the day since I'm in... <laughs> Okay. Excellent. All right. So here are my disclosures, none which are reflective of anything we did in this particular case. It's a 65 year old who presents with an NIH stroke score of six from right sided weakness and numbness. Uh, this is his original CAT scan. Uh, he has a pretty high aspects. I would say we would put him somewhere between eight and nine. There's something going on out here. And there may, by, may be a small uh, in, uh, area of hemorrhage in the region, uh, which is hypointense. We do a CTA head and neck. This is part of the original study that gets done within 10 minutes of presentation. And you can see there is a pretty high grade stenosis uh, in the distal left internal carotid artery. In addition, there appears to be a plaque uh, close to the ostium of the left common carotid artery. And there is uh, what likely a tail of clot, which extends from that plaque at the left uh, ostium. No clear large vessel occlusion is noted on the intracranial imaging. This is a CT perfusion. Again, this is the part of the study that is done when patients come in. And this suggests that there is a likely embolus uh, in the distal paracentral, postcentral uh, MCA, M5, M6 branch with a very subtle increase in time to peak throughout the left hemisphere. Um, and here is an MRI. He, is not, he doesn't get a thrombectomy or anything. He gets an MRI and you can see multiple uh, hits probably a combination of embolic and potentially some um, watershed type distribution uh, extending between the MCA and ACA as well, and a small hemorrhage in one of the regions with an infarct uh, in the left uh, temporal region. So summary, 65 year old with an NIH of six scattered embolic infarcts, possibly some watershed hits on DWI, small temporal ICH, lesion with intraluminal thrombus at the left common carotid artery origin and high-grade left ICA post-pulp stenosis. So I would love to hear from uh, Dr. Harbaugh and uh, Dr. Yeah. Wilson, your thoughts. Well, th this is one where I think with those sort of tandem uh, lesions, um, this, this is one where I think, you know, having the endovascular option uh, would be really uh, very helpful. Um, you know, he can address both you know, various ways to, to, to do that. Um, but but this, this is one I would uh, refer to uh, one of my dual trained colleagues and ask them to consider um, endovascular to address both lesions at the same time. You know, the, I, I agree with that, but the thing that I'd be concerned about in this case is the, the thrombus yeah. at, at the proximal 
um, uh, stenosis at the origin. And having to cross that to uh, get up to, to um, the carotid bifurcation and to treat that proximal lesion, um, you know, could create potentially uh, some concern for, for distal embolus. I know there's been at least one case where we have um, taken a patient similar to this and done an end arterectomy and retrograde um, went down and treated the proximal lesion, um, you know, intraoperatively. And that, uh, and that one circumstance uh, worked out very well. And I, I think that certainly I would talk to the, the tool do, two dual training people we have here uh, about that kind of possibility in this case and see what they, they thought about it. I think that's a good option, John. That that's, makes a lot of sense. I think that's an excellent option. Um, any other thoughts, uh, Bernard, Gavin? Well, I, but first of all, I'd get a good angio. The thing is, you know, I think that this case is something that you don't have to cross the lesion. I'd at least get an arch autogram because you want to have as much information possible before you make a decision. So I'd want to go, this, this guy must go to the angiogram suite, at least to get a diagnostic. Don't cross the lesion, as John says, but I'd want to have more information exactly what is going on. Okay. All right, so this is what we did. Um, we admitted the patient to the ICU, kept the blood pressure uh, 130 to 150, and we haponized the patient, um, keeping the PTT very tightly controlled between 60 and 80 with serial CT scans, um, because we thought this is somebody who would need to be heparinized, would need to be placed on aspirin and Plavix. Uh, we are concerned about that temporal hemorrhage that we had seen on the original CAT scan and MRI, and uh, we are concerned that putting this uh, somebody like this on dual antiplatelets and extending the hemorrhage might be an issue as well. So that was something really front and center of mind. We made sure that the hemorrhage did not extend through a reversible agent. And then we did exactly what Gavin suggested. We did not catheterize any vessels because off uh, the plaque you can see here, there's some calcium right in that com common origin and a little delayed image shows uh, what is clearly a glob of thrombus that's sitting in there. This is three days later on heparin. And you can see there's a little bit of a tail from the clot that's extending forward from the angiogram. So. Um, that's the angiogram. Um, what would you do? And by the way, uh, it shows the stenosis up in the internal, high up. We did not get any more selective imaging. So is that good enough for you, Gavin, to come up with a plan? Um, I need to, yeah, I mean, you, at least you know exactly what you have now. Uh, I've done, so what I would do now is I'd really review how high is this, uh, how, much, how much stenosis up in the neck? The, the stenosis, uh, let me go back. It's not that high. It's below the angle of the uh, jaw. So I think it's probably C3, 4. But I, so I think I'll still treat this endovascularly. I think you can get past the stenosis, you know, put your filter up distal to everything, treat the distal lesion first, and on the way back, treat the, treat, treat the most proximal lesion. That's okay. what I would do in this one. All right. So that's total endovascular. We heard the hybrid procedure from John. Do an end art, go retrograde. Any other thoughts? Uh, Ali, how would you handle the case? Is Ali there? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, probably from an endovascular route, uh, like, like Gavin was saying. Okay. All right. So this is what we did. Uh, we did a uh, transcarotid T-car type approach here. And um, I will sort of skip through the in introduction here. And so we went um, to the patient. There is the incision we made at the sternocleidomastoid, uh, open direct exposure of the common carotid artery, and uh, put Rommel tourniquets above and below the exposure of the common. Um, and then uh, take the T-car Silk Road uh, uh, system, which allows you to basically have a venous um, a return for uh, returning the blood and reversing flow across the lesion. And this is a pigtail catheter present at the level of the arch. There you can see the lesion. This is direct access. Uh, we can see the degree of stenosis. 
we have established in idiosynosis, we then uh, go ahead and deliver the system. And once we have the system in place, we do our complete angiography to make sure we are good and uh, make sure there's nothing else that is missing. Then create a roadmap, cross the lesion under flow reversal, do a plasty, then lay a stent out, uh, and then confirm under flow reversal with IVUS that things are good. Uh, and once we have confirmed that, then what we do is we reverse the orientation of the, of the sheath to point down. And uh, again, we now do a reverse flow and see that's where the lesion is. And once we have that, then we just cross the lesion with, again, rumel, rumel tourniquets are occluded. So this is complete flow arrest. So there's no concern that the thrombus is going to travel anywhere. And now we are using a covered stent. It's balloon mounted and put it across the lesion and inflate it into place. And then withdraw the system, uh, fl flush out, uh, uh, aspire whatever clot might have released before you release the tourniquets and then do a pigtail run to confirm that there's complete patency and then close the lesion. Um, the patient actually ended up doing very well. Sorry about the font weirdness. Uh, MRS of two, NIH uh, of two at three months and uh, was discharged to rehab and did very well. So um, I would, that's what we ended up doing in this case. Um, again, that was, different that was really ways. Clever, uh, clever use of the TCAR system. That was, that was great. Uh, so, I mean, I think your approach is exactly what we would have done in the past. And I, we, that's how we used to do before the TCAR became a system. I'm only one year older than you, okay? I'm not, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Say that again? Probably one year older than you, but I agree. TCARs, I've, I mean, Alan Lumsden does the TCARs, yeah. I haven't done them, um, you know, but we, we, we'll start doing them together. I mean, this is a, that's a great idea. I didn't think of that, but that is a, is a more modern idea. Alan's done, Alan Lumsden's done about, uh, I think, 10 or 12 already. Yeah, we were part of that original trial. We did about 18, 20 of those on that original Roadster trial. And the fact is that if you look at the actual data, again, it's not randomized. Um, their stroke and death rate was 1.4% in that cohort of 130 or some odd patients, uh, all again, considered high risk. Um, so- And Adon, that is exactly, I know the ones that were done, yeah, were selected, selected to be extreme high risk. Oh yes. So that, I mean, so that's a good, that, that's good results. So those are very good results, right. But I think that's the value, again, the value of being able to do it one way or the other and combining and you know the right hand and the left hand working together to come up with novel solutions. I think that's, that's the best part of neurosurgeons doing this end of ask or strategy and coming up with the safest possible way and individualizing care. Uh, can I, Bobby, Bobby Stark, can I invite you to comment on this case uh, in general, TCAR and tandem lesions? What's, what are your thoughts? Yeah, be beautiful case and a nice outcome, Dr. Siddiqui. I, I was kind of thinking the same thing. I think this is a nice case for the hybrid suite. You could, you know, even do, consider doing an endarterectomy, and then you've got clamps on the internal, and then you can go down the common and drop a stent. It's probably the easiest thing for that, for that distal common clot stenosis. So then you'd have distal control. You're not going to get any clot, but I think the T-car is another nice way. I think that you know, we're, we're in probably having some improvements in carotid endarterectomy over time, but we are definitely having a lot of improvements in carotid stenting over time. You know, I think, you know, University of Miami, we favor endarterectomy for a vast majority of patients, but still, you know, radial approaches, TCAR, and MoMA are probably three of the things that, you know, and, and advances in better catheters are probably the three things that are really improving our endovascular outcomes as well. You know, I completely agree with all those uh, sentiments. In fact, I would sort of talk about this data that uh, Bob talked about from that um, combination study. I think it was uh, the ICSS follow-up looking at DWI hits. And if you look at the stenting arm, you still had hits on DWI that theoretically should be all gone like 30 days later. 
And part of the reason you have them is that all the stents have these massive tines that are open and you're plastying it and there's this cheese grating effect which continues well beyond the stenting. So there is the acute stroke that occurs when you are doing the procedure, but then post-procedure, uh, there's some data to suggest up to half the embolic events occur 24 hours and beyond stenting. And so with new stents that are out there, like the Fred, not the Fred, the Casper, or the mesh covered stents that are available in Europe now, I think might really make a significant sort of uh, progress in terms of making stenting a little bit more safer in terms of cheese grating. So I agree with you, lots of innovation happening. Eventually, endarterectomy is going to become a minority of procedures. I don't know. I don't know about that. It stood the test of time, as you know, for a few decades. And to be honest, it's, I mean, it's beautiful what you've just done, but really quite complicated, isn't it, technologically? It, it is, but, you know, the, I think if you control the hybrid suite, if you're there one way or the other, uh, it, it is quite seamless. For instance, you know, I do about 30 or 40 endotrectomies a year on a regular basis and 40 or 50 stenting. So it, it, it works seamlessly. And then you try to figure out novel ways. Okay, what's the lowest risk for each one? Um, I mean, yeah, I yeah. love that. I, I could see where Bernard was going with that. The moment I saw that external osteum stenosis and I saw the rich collateral, I knew where, we, where his head would go. Um, so it's, it's, it's the beauty of being able to have that mindset, I think, that allows you to bring those things in play and come up with novel solutions. Beautiful. Thank you, Adnan. Ali, may I invite you to share your case? Of course, uh, Dr. Morcos, my, my mentor and my older brother, thank you so much for your, for your kind invitation. I just want to sort of echo uh, what Adnan is saying. You, you know, neurosurgeons are competitive people by nature um, and uh, you know and we're, we're sort of always pinning one thing against another whether it's uh, aneurysms clipping versus coiling or stenting versus CEA and we're doing it not in a malicious way but just to kind of do things that are the best for our patients um, but I think as we're starting to learn these things can be complementary and, and, and it can be uh, tailored for patient and a situation. So I, ju I just like to present this um, case that I had. Let's, um, let's see. So 71 year old male uh, with a previous history of stroke, but made a very, very, very good recovery. AFEB, eloquist, hypertension, hypolipidemia, a vascular path, and comes in with dysarthria and mild weakness. Has a few new hits um, on the right side. Um, and uh, can, can you see my screen? Yeah, we see your screen. Sorry, it froze up on me for a second. And so uh, there's this right carotid stenosis, um, greater than 70% of thrombus on there. Uh, and uh, we, just for time's sake, I'll take you guys through it uh, for a little bit more and then ask uh, what would you do. Uh, so we decided to do an endarterectomy uh, on this gentleman. The endarterectomy, 20, 25 minutes cross clamp time. Uh, no SSCP changes or EEG changes. It was an uncomplicated. Um, maybe I should have been, I, I've thought of this case and, and I thought maybe I, like Dr. Wilson was saying, be very meticulous with that distal uh, cleaning. I also remember sort of Haros, which I didn't do in this case, sort of, telling me to put tack up stitches at the, at the end. Anyway, we, we, we closed up, everything was okay, he woke up okay. And within an hour, he became plegic uh, on, on the left side and um, had this CT, um, CTA, if you will. Um, so- Hold on, Ali, Ali, may I interrupt you? Because this is like an in interesting point to ask the panelists. Uh, anybody could answer this. Patient wakes up, plegic, I mean, plegic one hour later. What, what's, what do you do? Do you do a repeat study? Do, anybody goes straight back to the OR, not to waste time? Uh, John or Bob? I, How I prepare the OR, but I, I run through the CTA scan on the way. I think the information that you get 
versus the amount of time it takes, it's, it's worth it. You know, back in the days when we would have to get them to the angio suite to get a decent study or, you know, try to get an MRA or MRI or something, um, you know, it, it just wouldn't be worth it. And I would have taken them straight back to the OR. But n now with the ready availability of CTA and it not taking more than, you know, five, 10 minutes on the way to the OR, I would, I would definitely do the CTA. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the era of rushing people back to the operating room is, is gone. I mean, for one thing, if you cross clamp this guy and there was no ischemic change, why do you think an occlusion now in the neck would be the, the problem? I mean, if you can't see the distal vessels, you're, you're missing the, the, the real problems. I think the CTA makes sense and then you have a better idea of exactly um, what you're, you're dealing with. We actually looked at this issue uh, a few years ago and it's a distinct minority of patients who uh, present with you know post-operative symptoms like this that have a internal carotid occlusion so you'd be taking an awful lot of patients back to the operating room delaying definitive treatment and not accomplishing anything because the carotid in the neck would be open so uh, I, I think this is the way to go Okay, so so now we we go back to the, o, the the panelists. Would everybody go back to the OR? Would somebody go to the angiography suite? So what would you? One other thing to keep in mind is that it's rare, but you also have to deal with the prospect of a hyperperfusion syndrome and a hemorrhage. Um, so I think going to the CT scanner absolutely makes a lot of sense, uh, and because of exactly what Bob said. You know, you just cross clamp this thing. So you know you've got something which is distal. And if you go to the OR, unless you've got a hybrid suite, which I think, again, one of the key messages is that we need to control the hybrid suite better. And neurosurgeons lose out to the vascular surgeons. And that is a mistake. I think we really should routinely do these procedures in the hybrid suite. So you can look distally because the problem here is uh, beyond, uh, is beyond PCOM. And um, you know, for that, you need to bring in some endovascular tools. So I think going back to the OR um, is the standard old mantra, but just doesn't hold water in the current day and age. So uh, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Harbo, you were talking about your series. I think Dr. Harbo had 0.2% with, with, with an embolism. What is, I know it happens rarely, uh, but when it happens, how do you reperfuse, and what are the rates of reopening this with a with a Fogarty balloon? Well, I, I think that there's in an acute occlusion like this. I think that there's a high uh, likelihood of being able to reopen this. And I think one of the key um, points that I would make is um, before you start passing Fogartys or anything, I, I get into the OR, open up the endarterectomy site and you know don't have the internal um, cross clamped at all a lot of times the clot or the platelet aggregate or whatever it is will deliver itself but if it doesn't you know then going through things like valsalva maneuver having the patient cough uh, oftentimes that will um, you know the increasing the venous pressure intracranially and in the cavernous sinus will help deliver uh, things out because i think it, the the less you have to instrument the uh, distal internal carotid, the, the more likely it is that it's going to stay open long term. So I always try to do that first and then would pass a Fogarty if, if I was unable to get it open otherwise. So what could you tell about the intracranial um, uh, vessels on your CT angio? It, it, Dr. Arbor, it didn't look very good. It, it, it wasn't... It, I couldn't tell how high it, it extended. The intracranial vessels seemed open, but I couldn't tell how high this uh, extended. It came in and out. So I thought maybe there were multiple areas of clot, but intracranially it was okay, but he was hemiplegic uh, from the... So I, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm perplexed by this because, um, you know, why should the internal occlusion, if there's not any distal embolization, be a problem now when it wasn't um, a problem um, intraoperatively? 
and yeah, intraoperatively, we, I pushed their blood pressure up and so forth. Uh, maybe that had to do with it. The, it was under general anesthesia, so there were signals, but they weren't changed. Okay. Well, I mean, I agree with, with, with John. I think that, you know, if you don't see anything intracranially, the only reason you have for the deficit is this uh, internal occlusion in the neck. Uh, the likelihood of being able to get that open again um, is very high. Um, you can address any technical issues that might have been missed at the, the first operation. And, and you know, Dr. Wilson is exactly right. Usually in this setting, um, you know, when you open that vessel, you don't have a clamp on the internal. You'll often see a spontaneous uh, delivery of the clot back into the endarterectomy site. So I would approach this the way uh, John said under those circumstances. All right. Um, any, well, you see what we ended up doing, but anybody else, uh, Gavin? Well, just, well, Ali, I would not. First of all, I agree with them. Um, and the reason being, I'd get a CT. I wouldn't even go to angel suite because the problem is you don't want to put a stent in a fresh clot. So I would have made sure there's no hemorrhage and to get a CTA of the next trade. I wouldn't take the angel. I know you can get a diner CT in the angel, but I would have yep. done exactly that. I would not have taken the angel. I would have got CT, CT head to make sure there's not, I wouldn't have got a CT head. Just got a CT to make sure there's a hemorrhage. Patient straight down to the OR, reopen up. I think going to angio, you know, is easier these days. And I'll show you about my case. I mean, why I do a lot more angels than a lot of the other guys do. Um, but I think it helps you. But I, in this case, I would have went straight back to the OR after a CT head to rod hemorrhage and a CTA, but take him straight back. Uh, my personal vote would be to, I like the CT head and neck because if it's an M2 occlusion or M1 occlusion, you want to know that because that, the approach would be different. Um, that's. I, 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 would, I would say, Ali, I would take them to the angel suite because I believe that uh, even though your CTA might not have been very clear and many times there's motion artifact, people are moving, you don't get good enough images. This is not a proximal carotid. You just did the case and yes, you didn't have signals. I would, I would, uh, th there is no, pr you don't, you just don't need to plasty a fresh endotrectomy. Uh, you can just lay a stent and it'll open it up. There's no plaque anymore and then just aspirate your way up top. Um, I think it can be done safely, effectively, and most importantly, allows you to exclude those distal emboli, which probably are there. I think it's not, you can do everything you can do in the operating room and you can go intracranially. Um, again, ideally, this would be a hybrid suite where you do exactly what you're talking about, reopen. And if that does the trick, then you can do an angiogram at the same time. Unfortunately, we don't do that, which is a mistake. Um, yeah. So th th that's exactly my, my point. So as Dr. Harbo showed, you know, we have to get our complication rates lower and lower and lower and symptomatic patients, it's no longer acceptable to, to do it at 6%. It's gotta be down to 3%. Uh, is the future of this, especially as more and more vasculars or surgeons are training in hybrid sort of environments to do all of these cases angio ready. And if there are that 0.2% as in Dr. Harbo showed chance of an embolus or something, you're there to catch it and you over decrease the overall risk of, uh, of the procedure. I don't know if I, what I did was the correct way of, of doing it. And, and this is a hybrid room and we were prepared to do both. Uh, but this is how I started and how I ended up. Um, and, and I don't know if stenting is correct in this situation, but that's what we did. So I'll, I'll do it for a 30 second video. So this is- Ali, did you focus. have proximal control? Did you have a balloon in the mm -hmm. neck? I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, uh, for in terms of distal protection, how did did you manage? What was your strategy for distal? Uh, it, it, this was a suction catheter. Uh, you, you see this catheter here. This is this is one of the big suction. Ali, Ali can you put a better view? Like the screen is small. Uh, is that the best way you can show it? Uh, no, I can show it bigger. Yeah, if you can just full screen it, I think that'll help. That yeah. yeah, 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 better. Uh, just a couple of points, and, 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 and it's to illustrate that there is a fusion of an adjunctive instead of competitive. Um, so this is a suction catheter, Bernard, as you know, and, and then this is the micro catheter. Uh, I'll just play it fast. We were able to get through uh, the, the clot, um, and we then deployed, and so it was open distally, as you can see. 
uh, but from the point of where the big catheter is here to the top, it was uh, clotted off into the sort of skull base. And maybe a, a fogarty was enough uh, to back bleed that. Uh, this is a stent retriever with all of these little dots. This is a suction catheter. Um, and this is us pulling that back. It opened the vessel as we we're suctioning and pulling back. But if you look at here, it's what Dr. Wilson said. I don't think I had, I either overstitched it or left a, here. I left something there, either plaque not cleaned out enough or not properly stitched, but there was a stenosis and it was impeding flow. So we loaded the patient with Plavix um, and ended up stenting. Um, intracranially, everything was open. Um, he, the vessel opened up. Um, this is a delayed MRI. He did have new stroke burden from this and he was hurt uh, as a consequence of of these complications. Um, and, and I mean, this is a good job, but the thing about it, and that's the one thing I'm concerned about me, uh, you know, when, when I don't know, I was agreeing with it. When you're gonna go do this, I'd be worried that you're gonna push distal clot yeah. distal. And I know that, I mean, I know you use a sex suction cath and all that, but I do think you're gonna find some clots, even that you're not gonna have an M2 occlusion maybe, but you can have some distal vessels and that guy's gonna be showered with clots. So that's why even though I do endovascular, 20% of my practice, I would still, this one, take to the OR. Well, I, again, just to counter that, I would do this with a MoMA type device. And I think that's what I think Bernard was talking about as well, is you don't need a distal. I would do exactly what you did, but if you had fluoresce proximally in the common, so you could have addressed the carotid and probably not induced. I mean, there might've been embolic events already taken place before you ever got there. That's possible. But I, I think every time we do these, uh, there's a risk of distal shower. Um, and that's the advantage of doing what John and uh, Bob are talking about with doing an endotrectomy is because you have complete floor reversal. Um, you can do the Fogarty. And in this case, um, that would have resolved the problem. But if you're going to do endovascular, I think we need proximal control. Thank you. Car actually may be a good one for this case as well. You know that? Say that so, again? What do you think about a T car for this case? If you had to do it again, because then you're going to get real proximal uh, flow control. Well, I, yeah. I, I, I like Ali's idea of doing this in the hybrid suite. You need to put an A-line in these patients. Just put a femoral or a radial so you have your access. And then you have all the salvage you need. At the end of the procedure, just take the A-line out if there was no problem. And if there is, you have access. I think we need to take a, you know, make a stake in the hybrid suite. I think that's really important for dual uh, guys. Agreed. I gotta say, I'll, as far I'll, as I'll PCAR add. is concerned for this though, I, I, I gotta, it doesn't make sense to me to make another incision in the carotid more proximal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're gonna cut down the carotid anyhow, just take the staples out or the stitches and your end arterectomy is, your site is right there. You're, you're open in a few seconds. Dr. Wilson, there, there's balloons. Well, this is how we do thrombectomies. You're, you're right. You can just inflate a proximal balloon and you have flow arrest and, and yeah. then you have a suction catheter and it's... Right, right. Hey, Jacques, could I share my screen for a second? Sure. I promise I won't take up too much time, but we looked at um, 36 patients out of the whole series with an early post-operative event. Um, 22 turned out to be ischemic stroke, 12 were TIAs, and then there were two hemorrhages. Um, and what, what we asked were, what were the risks and benefits of these various diagnostic and treatment approaches? Primarily, do you image or do you go right back to the uh, operating room? Um, Two of the patients had intracerebral hemorrhage, which was diagnosed on CT. I won't talk any more about that. They both ended up with uh, Rankin uh, three uh, strokes. Um, of the 34 patients who had postoperative ischemia, um, we found um, there were cranial CT findings in the 34 patients. Um, and, and it, there were no new lesions seen on the intracranial plane CT scan. 
but if we did uh, either angiography or CT angiography, um, 23, we couldn't find any, any pathology, neck or intracranial, and those you know, resolved. Uh, there were four internal carotid artery occlusions, so those four would have benefited potentially from going right back to the operating room, but that's four out of 34. Um, there were two additional patients who had uh, technical errors, uh, an intimal flap and distal stenosis, so those two potentially could have benefited from going back. Um, and, uh, but, but that's still a very distinct minority of these patients who would benefit from a trip back to the operating room without imaging the, the, the vessels. And I think the other um, point is that um, if you have distal embolization and the carotid looks okay in the neck, which was the majority of, of the, the case, now you have an option of going in for clot retrieval and not wasting the time going back to the, the operating room and, and reopening the, the neck. You, you make a very good point, Bob. You're right. Thank you. Uh, if you could stop sharing and then I'll ask Gavin to share his case. All right. Okay, so mine's gonna be a little, little pretty simple. Can you see my cases? Yeah, we no, only see yeah. your name. You don't see it? Okay, see that? No. Remember, you, like you did earlier, the share screen. Oh, we were sharing. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, you see it now? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm going to give you basically a lot more simple. I've not, you know, used the methods, ran into too many complications. So this is not a complication, unlike the Buffalo guys. Anyway, this is a 57 year old female. Can, sorry, can you click on play, play it, not the navigation mode? Okay. Play, yeah. Play the one slide. Yeah, here you go. Okay. Right. Yeah. So this is a 57 year old female, uh, fast medic history of long standing type 2 diabetes, hypertension, a smoker, but stopped 15 years ago presented with four episodes of left arm weakness over a pair of 24 hours. Uh, CT and MRI were both negative for, uh, for strokes and she had an echo workup as well, which was normal. Uh, she had a, she saw a neurologist that got the CTA, uh, both head and neck. And as you can see, she's got a smooth uh, narrowing of her right ICA just above the bifurcation. Left side was showing was was normal. So any other imaging that you guys would do, John, Jock, Bob. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Jo John, any other imaging besides what we have before you make your decision? No, so she it sounds like she's had a right hemisphere TIA, as she has a right carotid uh, internal carotid stenosis. Um, not you know unless i'm missing something I, I i think based on what i've seen so far i probably would have taken her to the or i suspect that that's going to be the wrong answer no, no, just for the presentation <laughs> but but that's what i would do in all honesty i agree on all points and i'm waiting for the next shoe to drop yeah so the thing about it is that i brought this image up because i think that a lot of john and bob in the old data angiography was not done often for these guys. People thought that it's really dangerous, but I find, as I'll show you now, it's helpful for me. So I do angiograms, okay? And this is one, we did the angiogram, which clearly shows the stenosis. I also do the intracranial run, obviously a common run that shows one. This image, which looks like there's you know, an atriotic uh, right, a, uh, right uh, A1. And the reason I do this is I'll tell you a little later. But anyway, if you do an angio, you can only could, you know, would you only do the symptomatic side or would you guys do both all four vessels or six vessels? Adnan? Four vessels or at least three. I would do a common on the other side and avert to look at collaterals because that could be a washout and just reflective of very high grade cervical stenosis. So John, in your practice and Bob, do you guys get angios or were you taking this patient straight to the OR? Straight to the OR. Adnan? Yeah, OR. Angio. Not angio. Always, always angio. Yeah, me as well. And I'll show you, I mean, I'll show you why. And I'm, I'm going to see, so this is the angio. 
So unlike, as Anand said, the left, left common, left ICA shows great crossfill, plush has got a peacock. And the reason I do this is that I use this information. I look at the, you know, how high the growth application is. And also want to really look at the disease. The CTA is pretty good these days, but it doesn't give you as much information as plaque, dissection, unstable. And most importantly, I look at the collateral circulation. And I think with carotid disease, and getting back to what Bob said, our risks and our complications have to be so low. So for me these days, to do an endotorectomy, everything has to be optimal. If it's not optimal, those patients go for, go for a stent. And I, I personally think I used to shun patients, but now if I can predict, and it's not an absolute prediction, but if I can say this patient is most likely going to need a shun, I'm going to send the patient to, the, I'm going to, I'm going to stand the patient. In this situation, if I got the CTA, I would have probably thought, well, she may have needed a shun, but getting the angio like Adnan shows, shows me this patient's got a great collateral circulation. I can go inside there, do the case, and no one won't need a shun and get her in and out. She's young, she's female, She's an ideal candidate for a CEA. The other question I'll bring up about do you guys do patches? And I know, I mean, this is an easy case, you know, much like uh, John said, I only patch if needed. And that's the, you know, two years follow-up of an angiogram. And the overall theme of my, my talk is basically not complications, is that I try and keep my endotorectomies very simple. You know, use the methods, I have a lot of competition. I have to have almost zero complications. And the way to do that is to make it very, very simple. So anything complicated, bilateral stenosis gets stented. You know, no collateral flow gets stented. Some of that I'm gonna, you know, any complications they get stented. The ones I do on directomy these days is someone that has got a perfect case for an directomy. Otherwise I stent them. That's all I got. I mean, I don't have much complications here. Thanks, no, Kevin. I mean, the, the Andrew has to have some complication. It does, but it's so small. I mean, hold on, I'm trying to get you. The, the thing about it is that if you look at most of us these days that do a lot of angios, um, let me try and join you guys again. It is so low. And I think that, you know, I, I think the, the, the Columbia group looked at their angio complication rates and it was minuscule about 10 years ago. And I think if you look at the complication rates these days, it is even less. So for me, the, you know, the whole thing about this talk is, I try to do it and not keep it keep it very simple. And if it's not simple, I stand them. I think CTAs are really useful for evaluating primary anatomy. Now, why do we do a diagnostic angiogram? I, I, I'd be honest, sometimes I wonder why. I think it's just a matter of um, traditional workup that we engage in, in many cases, I think CTA gives you a lot of information, but every now and then you, you, you miss things. Um, the, the resolution of CTAs is excellent for carotid evaluation. It's really in the eye of the neuroradiologist when it comes to intracranial circulation. And uh, we routinely will miss things like small fistulae, small aneurysms, others, and so, while that might not be necessarily germane to the carotid lesion that you are treating or not treating, um, we routinely do diagnostic angiograms and our complication rates, unfortunately, we are still in August, are higher in the first quarter than the last quarter of the year. So I think there is a risk to it and I sometimes do wonder if we really need it, but we do it. No, okay. I'm sorry, let me, I just want to have time to go over the questions from the audience, if that's okay. Gavin, you're unable to unshare your screen. Uh, otherwise, let me, let me ask some questions. Bobby or Carolina, um, if, if you want to also look with me, if you see a particularly good question, you want to pause it, jump in. I'll just start with the, um, can I ask, uh, just the first one. Um, and uh, maybe we can ha we have time for one answer uh, unless somebody strongly disagrees. Can you anybody comment on the cost difference between CEA and stenting, let's say at a one year follow up? Anybody wants to tackle the cost issue? This is from sure. There's a, tremendous. there's a lot of data, um, published data that indicates that there's significant cost savings from uh, carotid endarterectomy as opposed to carotid stenting. 
Yeah, and one of the things we found too is, is it, uh, one of the reasons I switched from uh, general anesthesia to regional anesthesia it used to piss me off to find out that the neurologist who was reviewing the EEG the day after the operation got paid more than I did for doing the uh -huh. surgery. So, um, regional anesthesia is uh, very cost uh, effective too. Exactly. Yeah, that's you the, add to the, the cost of regional endarterectomy or regional anesthesia as opposed to general or stenting. Yeah. Right. So, Josh. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was, no, I was just going to say call. you were muted. Yeah, no, uh, sorry, I was answering a phone call. Um, uh, a question from Dr. Mohammed Al Fiki: Is there an age difference that may affect your final conclusions about stenting versus uh, endarterectomy? Anybody wants to tackle the age issue? Well, yeah, I think that, go ahead. Don't know if you can go ahead, Dr. Harbour. That was well covered, I thought, in your slides. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the the uh, initially. It was thought that advanced age would be a, a make it a dangerous carotid, so they should be stented. It turns out that age does not seem to affect the risk of endarterectomy. Um, uh, there just doesn't seem to be an effect there. The uh, older patients do seem to do worse with endovascular um, treatment, and since I don't do that, I, you know, you can um, I'll defer to somebody else as to why that might be the case. But I think there really is an age effect with uh, older patients benefiting from open surgery more than endovascular. We came up with this thing called the Buffalo Risk Assessment Score, called the BRAS score, and and that really uh, quantifies this risk. And it's while it's related to age, it's not dependent on age. It's it's got to do with tortuosity. And the vascular procedures are easier in straighter vessels. And if you've got a tough arch, uh, I think it's complicated. I think radial starting to make a dent in that tough arch concept because of transradial approach. Um, but on the whole, I think you need to evaluate the anatomy. You look at the plaque. Um, uh, you look at collateral circulation. I think that makes a big difference. For instance, again, we were talking about asymptomatic disease and Dr. Harba is really looking forward to Crest 2 providing that, you know, shining light. I, I, I'm a bit nervous about how people are enrolling, even though they have like 17, 1800 patients in that trial. I think there's a lot of selection bias in there. Um, I say that as a site that is enrolling. I look at collateral circulation or perfusion scans in all my patients. And I really think um, if somebody has got a um, high degree of uh, collateralization, um, age is irrelevant. On the other hand, if they have a really isolated hemisphere, asymptomatic or not, again, age is irrelevant. I, don't know, I agree with you. I think the biggest thing, you, when you got always some arrests, when you go to war, you want to have as much information available before you go there. And evaluating the collateral circulation as, an, as a vascular surgeon is extremely important regardless of what you do. And that's why an angiogram is really good. Along the lines, you, you, you were mentioning um, that to analyze the type of the plaque and a little bit of the anatomy of the plaque, um, one of the audience members wanted to know whether or not you utilize advanced MR sequences in the preoperative uh, imaging to identify features of like a vulnerable plaque. We've done that for research, but not for um, making clinical decisions. Is that, um, is that the vessel wall imaging? Um, yes. Yeah. There are two types. There's the black blood image sequence, which works better for cervical coils, which is really, again, um, uh, it goes in the same category as doing pre-procedure transcranial doctors looking for microemboli or black blood showing plaque, um, and then vessel wall imaging. Again, I, I agree with Gavin. I'm a, I'm a hoarder when it comes to information, and I think the more information you have, uh, the better it is. So we routinely do that for asymptomatic patients. Okay. Um, one of the audience members asked, what do you think about uh, carotid endarterectomy or ICA stenting for acute stroke? Can you speak a little bit to the timing? Any of you? Yeah. I'll, I'll speak to endarterectomy. Um, 
you know, the, the NASA trial indicated that it was uh, safe to perform endarterectomy in, in patients with acute stroke, uh, acute non-disabling stroke. And so, you know, if, if a person still has territory at risk, um, then we will, we will perform an endarterectomy, you know, as soon as they are, are in the hospital. If they've had, already had a hemorrhagic conversion, or if there's really, you know, no additional territory at risk, the, the completed infarct, then, you know, that there's, we, we may not um, proceed urgently. But otherwise we do them all same day or the next day. Yeah, I agree. You know, there are two categories there. One is the symptomatic patient who comes in with the stroke. Um, and that's the one that I think John and Bob are talking about. The other is NIH, 10 plus who comes in with an acute carotid occlusion with a tandem occlusion, what to do about these. I think um, even though these patients have been uniformly excluded from the prospective trials, uh, one, one needs to recognize that that's about 20% of large vessel occlusions have tandem occlusions, 20%. Um, and uh, the best way to deal with them is to go ahead, cross the lesion, open the intracranial, Personally, I think the better way to do this is to stent them at the same time. I tend to stent them first and then go ahead and deal with the intracranial. And uh, uh, based on Mr. Clean, which was the only trial that allowed those patients, uh, there was tremendous benefit to reopening these acute occlusions. But uh, it really depends on the size of the stroke. If you've got a moderate size stroke and you're going to start antipathy therapy, dual, your hemorrhage risk is going to be much higher. So in those situations, you can do the thrombectomy, um, and do angioplasty, but I actually, and we, we have data here, which we must publish. If you, if you have a moderate sized stroke and you start that antipathy therapy dual, you're, you're gonna have a hemorrhage risk. I agree with you, but I think the, 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 the deficit from re, non-revascularization far exceeds the hemorrhagic. Well, I agree, but I think in those situations, do an angioplasty I've, and I'll, then come back. Sure, I, I've been selective. I've done, most of the time I've done what I've not said. I, I put a stent in at the same time, but uh, there are cases if I'm nervous. I've had, I had a case recently where the patient was very far out uh, and uh, I just did angioplasty and I'm bringing him back for a st uh, stent. So that's another way to do it. You know, th despite reopening, you, you, you sometimes don't know the overall st stroke burden. So our strategy is if you if you can angioplasty and it stays open, leave it like that, check it in a few days, and then come back and and stent. Uh, we looked at our patients uh, in Miami actually before I, we left. Uh, Twenty six patients. They actually did better when they had these tandem occlusions, whether that carotid stenosis over years built up good collaterals. They they did better in acute stroke when when they had tandem occlusions. Uh, Bob, uh, about using patch, do you ever use patch? Uh, you don't do too many recurrent endarterectomies. That was used to be the old indication. Any? Yeah. So, so early on, uh, when I was doing, uh, you know, people who'd had previous surgery, I would always patch the recurrent uh, ones. If there was somebody who had a particularly small vessel, I would occasionally use a patch in, in a, a new endarterectomy. I haven't used a patch for years because the recurrent stenosis now I think is best treated endovascularly and um, you know keeping the operation simple and, and just doing a meticulous primary closure I think is the best way to, to go. Uh, Ali, is it, how is it possible to treat a delayed stent occlusion? Uh, we've, we've had a few, usually when people take off prematurely from dual antiplatelets, which should be on for six weeks or so. But I think it goes along the same sort of video that I, I just showed. You are able to recanalize and use the same essential, the same techniques that you use for a thrombectomy. Um, so, so it's the same, it's the same sort of concept. Go suck it out, stent retrieve it. Sometimes you need to give Reapro or Integral and uh, something like that. But, but the point is how soon you can catch it from its thrombosis. Um, this is anybody from the panel. Would uh, using intravascular ultrasound finding change your decision making in asymptomatic patients? 
So I re routinely use intravascular ultrasounds in 100% yes. of my carotid stent cases. And it's not about trying to see what the plaque look like, looks like before I do the case. I always use the IVUS after the stent, right before I remove the filter right. to make sure I haven't cheese graded something that I might not see on angiography. And I can tell you it helps me one in 50 cases. That is about the rate of asymptomatic, uh, of symptomatic stroke. So I, I'm a strong believer. Again, it's about minimizing risk in all these cases. Yeah, uh, but don't you think that, I mean, the, the, the intent of the question, I guess, is, is can we identify a subgroup of higher risk asymptomatic cases? You, you, I do that preoperatively. The Doppler ultrasound gives you beautiful information about what the plaque looks like. I, I mean, uh, it is underutilized. Um, I run the Doppler lab here in, in, uh, at our vascular institute. And I, I, I mean, all the information you really need is there if you add that with the black morphology. Uh, okay. Uh, John, uh, what suture material do you use for your endarterectomy? I use uh, 6 0 Pronova. It's a proline like suture monofilament. Um, Seems to have less memory than proline. That's what I. Uh, Bob, same thing or same. What? same? Used to use proline, but it's a little stiff. So you use ethylon? Yeah. Okay. Um, does anybody, uh, uh, who, can we answer Dr. Pablo Rubino? What is an absolute indication for stenting in case you, you have it? Who, anybody would like to say? That's it. The endarterectomy makes no sense. Stenting is the way to go. Symptomatic. Well, if, you have a payment, if you have a payment that's due on your Lamborghini, <laughs> and you're, and then you must do the stent if you're an endovascular specialist. But beyond that, I'm not sure. I'll let Bob answer. <laughs> yeah, if, if I if symptomatic recurrent stenosis. I mean, I think somebody who's had a previous endarterectomy, that operation, even if the stroke risk isn't dramatically higher, the risk of cranial nerve injury is, is significantly higher. It's no fun to do that operation. Mm -hmm. And that's one that would, oh, I would always send to the endovascular specialist. Well, uh, and the last question was already answered and it is 7.28. Uh, I'll give you any last minute question, comment anybody before I let you go, all go. I just want to thank you for putting this together, Jacques. This was a, a great symposium. You, they, they all have been great. You've really been doing a great job. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate you uh, asking me to participate. I Same here. here. Thank you. Great thank work. you to thank the, the participants, coming. panelists, my co-directors, uh, uh, speakers. Have a good evening if you're on the East Coast. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.